When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends, Jared Halverson here. Welcome back to Unshaken. If you are still with me after last week's lesson, congratulations. I was thinking the other day, on the backs of cars, sometimes you'll see that sticker that says 26.2, which is a, a nice way of saying, look how far I've run. I've, I've accomplished a marathon. Or a 13.1, hey, I did a half marathon. Well, a lot of the sections that we've studied this year have been 5Ks or 10Ks. We've had a couple of half marathons. Section 88 was a marathon. So if I could give you each a sticker that says Doctor and Covenants 88 to put on the back of your window, uh, I, I, I congratulate you. I honor you for sticking with me for three hours plus uh, to plow our way through that incredible revelation. I hope it was as meaningful to you as the Lord intended it to be for all of us. It is a masterpiece, start to finish, power packed with so much dense doctrine. Uh, big picture things, uh, small details from start to finish. It, it is a, a masterpiece of scripture. And so if you didn't, weren't able to get through all of it, uh, this week will be a little bit shorter, uh, section 89 to 92. So maybe it'll afford you a chance to go back and, and catch up a bit uh, with some of the things that we've been covering. Now, uh, like I said, section uh, this week, 89 to 92, the most famous, of course, is section 89, the word of wisdom. Most anybody who knows anything about Latter-day Saints seems to know a little bit of, of the word of wisdom, as far as the don'ts are concerned particularly. Oh, Latter-day Saints, oh yeah, they don't drink, they don't smoke, uh, they don't drink coffee and tea, and, and we'll get into the, some of the details of that as far as the scripture is concerned. Beyond it, uh, section 90 and 92 has some details about the First Presidency that's important, another step in the development of, of the presiding quorums of the church. And then 91 is this... Amazing little section uh, that often gets tossed aside as being irrelevant. It's about the Apocrypha. And if you're not a biblical scholar, it's like, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, more than we realize. I, I think section 91 has more uh, applicability and relevance than we often give it credit for. So I look forward to diving into these sections for today. Now, like I said, if anybody knows anything about Latter-day Saints, it's usually the word of wisdom. Uh, don't offer your Latter-day Saint friends uh, beer or coffee or tea or alcohol or whatever. They, they, they don't take it. It's against their religion. And that to me is an important detail. It's not just against our health, because that's true of everyone. It's against our religion. You see, in the 1830s, when this revelation was given, there were all kinds of temperance societies that were springing up all over America because the need for temperance societies existed. Temperance meaning, let's be temperate in our consumption of alcohol, to the point that in many of them, it, it was some opted for moderation, others, teetotalers they were called, said absolutely no alcohol whatsoever. Uh, according to most historians, the high point of alcohol consumption in American history was 1830 the same year the church was organized. And, and alcohol was everywhere. I remember the first time I drove through uh, Nebraska and just saw cornfields as far as the eye could see. And I remember thinking to myself, honestly, I, don't get me wrong, Nebraskans, I love corn. But who eats this much corn? And then somebody pointed out to me, high fructose corn syrup. And then it was like, oh, yeah, we all eat this much corn. Uh, well, in those days, it wouldn't have been corn for high fructose corn syrup. It would have been corn for whiskey. Oh, okay. Uh, and moonshine and distilleries and all over the American frontier. Uh, and so no wonder there is a, a perceived need in communities across America to create these temperance societies. And most likely seeing what all their neighbors were doing, the Latter-day Saints thought, is that a good idea? It probably is. But more than just uh, a social construction here, more than just looking at our neighbors and seeing what they're doing. What I love about the early Latter-day Saints is they did notice those things, but they took them to the Lord and received not just a, uh, I don't know, positive peer pressure or a, a social normalization of certain uh, activities or, or standards. It was, like I said, it's not just against our health. It becomes against our religion. 
We'll see that later with the, the organization of the Relief Society. All kinds of female benevolent societies were popping up in communities around America. But the Latter-day Saints said, we'll take that and, and, and raise it one. We'll take it to the Lord, and the Lord says, yes, what the other people, what others are doing in the world are positive. Uh, you, ha you don't have a corner on the market for positivity or, or righteous influence, or good ideas for that matter. But to take a good idea, this is part of plundering the riches of Egypt, okay? Uh, a good idea that's out there in the world, and then baptizing it in a way. Uh, to see, Lord, what would you have us do based on what we're seeing out there? Is there anything more you'd like us to know? And, and uh, rather than it simply being a matter of health, now it becomes a matter of spirituality. It's not just a temperance society. We receive by revelation the word of wisdom. It's not just a female benevolent society. We receive under keys of priesthood the organization of the Relief Society. It's not just oh, uh, a college or university that are, that are popping up left and right in, in frontier communities. It's... It's a, a house of learning. It's a school of the prophets. Eventually, it's a university of Deseret. And again, to see what the Lord is doing to elevate the, the common understanding of people. And I'm grateful for the elevation that we receive in revelations like section 89. Last week when we were studying section 88, I mentioned that there's a verse or two there that seemed to point forward to what we see today in section 89. I mean, they were told to prepare every needful thing. Uh, they were told that the, the soul is not only the spirit, it's also the body. And the resurrection is of the body equals the redemption of the soul. So we're starting to move in this bodily direction. Way back in section 29, we learned that there are temporal and spiritual things, and everything is under the big spiritual umbrella. So even physical things, like a physical body, are under the, the divine umbrella of spiritual things. We saw it in verse 124. Cease to be idle. Cease to be unclean. Yes, I do believe that we could put those as an, an addendum, uh, a, a prelude to the word of wisdom. Or when he says to cease to sleep longer than is needful. Retire to thy bed early that you may not be weary. Arise early that your bodies and your minds may be invigorated. I mean, I think all too often... Are we, are we no better in our understanding of the word of wisdom than the rest of the world? Because if they think, oh, Latter-day Saints, yeah, they can't drink and they can't smoke and, and they can't drink coffee or tea. If that's all we have boiled the word of wisdom down to, then we're missing the meat of this message. Uh, it's so much more than just those don'ts. The, the, the do's are incredible. And what we're seeing in that verse in, one, in section 88, verse 124, are some of those do's. Do work and exercise. Don't be idle. Do uh, work on personal hygiene. Don't be unclean. Do get the, the amount of sleep that your body needs. Do live in such a way that your body and your mind, interesting connection, uh, the body and the mind can be invigorated. I fear that there are a lot of Latter-day Saints out there that feel they are living the word of wisdom simply because they are abstaining from the, those substances on the to-don't list. But in some ways, this is, that's a better you know, indicator of, is it working for us? Like I said about the Sabbath, where I was, is that breaking the Sabbath? Well, you tell me. Is your Sabbath broken? How, do, how can I tell if it's broken? Well, it's not working according to its divine design. And, and I can tell if the Sabbath is working if it's doing to me what the Lord intended. Same with the word of wisdom. It's not just, did I break the word of wisdom in terms of those don'ts, but did I break it in terms of, is it working the way the Lord intended it? Is it helping my body and my mind? And in section 89, we'll add spirit. Is it invigorating those things? Or am I lethargic? Uh, am, I, am I lazy? Am, am I gluttonous? Am I controlling my body? Or are my bodily desires controlling me? One thing I really hope we'll take away from our study of section 89 is... For us to go past the little missionary flip chart that I used 25 years ago that just listed the don'ts of the word of wisdom. Yeah, there's a lot more to that. And even if we build on what we ended with last week, the establishment of the school of the prophets, I mean, it's in conjunction with that that this revelation of the word of wisdom is received. Think of it this way. If these brethren, if these elders, if these prophets, lowercase p, are coming to school to assemble and to organize themselves, 
uh, organizing their bodies is just as important as organizing their minds and their spirits. It's part of preparing every needful thing. It's one of the things I love about the YMCA, okay? this triangle there of body, mind, and spirit. It all comes together. To be told to establish a house of order, not of spittoons and of t- tobacco spit, to have a teacher offering himself to the Lord on his knees, or kneeling in a, in, a, in a puddle of tobacco spittle, both teacher and students assembling in, in token of the everlasting covenant while giving in to all of these physical or bodily appetites? I mean, promising with a, f- a determination that is fixed and unchangeable and immutable to be friends and brethren when they're forcing Emma Smith a wife and sister to to clean up after them no there's there's something wrong here and i'm impressed that it was emma first and foremost who noticed it and and dropped some subtle and not so subtle hints to her prophetic husband saying are are you sure you're doing this right honey now and as joseph takes it to the lord the lord sides with emma i'm not surprised and says yes there is a better way i'm so glad you asked so let me give you some clarification In fact, let me give you a revelation. In fact, let me give you a word of wisdom. That's what it's called in verse 1. A word of wisdom for the benefit of the council of high priests assembled in Kirtland and the church and also the saints in Zion. So this is for members of the church, saints, wherever they happen to be. In Kirtland, Ohio, in Zion, which is Independence, Missouri. It's for your benefit, first and foremost. This is not some kind of... It's not just another restrictive rule to keep you from having fun with your friends. No, this is for your benefit. In fact, this is wise. Remember he said uh, in an earlier revelation, I'm not going to call this a commandment because you guys don't seem to do very well with that word. You kind of chafe against rules. So let's, let's just say it's expedient in me. Let's say it's wise in me. Well, here it's one of those, this is wise. We'll see it over time grow into commandment level, but it's not quite there yet. In in fact, the first three verses here were technically not part of the original revelation. They were always included in as kind of an introductory statement to present the revelation that begins in verse 4. I believe it was during Brigham Young's presidency that they took those three verses of introduction and officially combined them with the rest. Yes, that's, that's worth canonizing as well. But I love that at the very beginning it was presented as, this is wisdom. And even though we call it the word of wisdom, Originally, it was called a word of wisdom to suggest there's a lot more wisdom where this came from. Don't limit yourself just to section 89. The way it was presented, verse 2, to be sent greeting, not by commandment or constraint, but by revelation and the word of wisdom, showing forth the order and will of God in the temporal salvation of all saints in the last days. Now, I don't know if Joseph could have softened his speech any more than he did there in verse 2. This is about as warm and welcoming as you can get. I mean, for many, the word of wisdom is, a, is what the Lord called a hard saying. Okay? Who can hear it? This is, this is difficult. Uh, perhaps you met those kinds of people in the mission field when you presented it, and they're like, what? Well, here, it, greetings. Welcome. Hello. I'm not coming uh, with guns blazing trying to condemn everyone for, for things they're doing wrong. I'm greeting you. You remember back in section 88, the salutation to to brethren. Here's a greeting to you. And I'm not coming out with a commandment or constraint. This is simply a revelation and a word of wisdom. Now, it, it gets a little stronger in the next phrase. This is the order and will of God. But And like I said, by the time you get to about the, the 1920s, Uh, This revelation and word of wisdom has become commandment and constraint. And some have wondered about that from either direction. Either, well, if it was never meant to be a commandment or constraint, then why did it become that? That's kind of erring on the side of of mercy uh, or ease. And the other uh, side of the argument is, well, why didn't he just start it as a commandment or constraint from the very beginning? That's erring on the side. That's the justice side of things holding people accountable for it. Well, that might have been part of the reason that it was a gradual implementation, because accountability for people that were sinning in ignorance. Well, you establish a commandment right there, 
especially when it comes to physical appetites that tend towards addiction. And, and while there are those who can just go end it cold turkey and more power to you, there are others that, that this is a battle that takes time to win. And so as other pro later prophets have suggested, perhaps the Lord gave it first as simply revelation and greeting and, and wisdom so that people could grow into their obedience and the Lord in his mercy to let them grow into their accountability. And I will say to those who want to stay on the softer level and are, are frustrated that it ever became a commandment or that they're feeling constrained by it, even in that early verse, this is the order and will of God. Now, it's not an order in terms of he's ordering you to do it. This is the order of God. We talk about the united order. We talk about the order of the priesthood. This last revelation was to establish a house of order. Let's, let's order our body. Let's be self-disciplined here. He's not ordering you to live this way yet. But this is part of an ordered existence. And as we saw, the heavens moving in their majesty, God moving in his majesty and power. The regular motion of the planets, worlds without number. It is an ordered universe. Are you? Do we, do we control our bodies? Or do we allow them to erupt in chaos? And when he says it's the will of God. Again, that's so much softer than com I command, I, I require. But if, it, if, if it's even just a hint, this is my will. Have we had it experienced this paradigm shift where we want to be crowned with commandments, not a few? Where we see any hint from the Lord that this is his preference of things, it's expedient, it's wise in him. Even when he says it mattereth not, you cannot go amiss. Choose for yourself. Is there still a desire on our, on our part to do it the Lord's way according to the Lord's will? And this is the Lord's will. It's meant for the temporal salvation of all saints, and I already mentioned it, section 29, nothing is merely temporal to the Lord. So this temporal salvation points toward your spiritual salvation as well. Verse 3, it was given for a principle with promise. And rather than thinking so much about commandment or, con or constraint, if we thought about promises of the Lord and, and then kind of reverse engineered them, this is where the Lord, this is the destination. How do I get there? This is the promise how can I live into those promises so they're fulfilled? What's the principle that's connected to them? We'll see later in section 130 that uh, obedience to law and blessings for obedience are inextricably linked. There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven whereon all blessings are predicated. If you obey a law, you receive the blessing that's predicated upon it. Or reverse that. When you receive a blessing, it's because you obeyed the law that was predicated upon it. You get that here. And then this interesting admission, adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints who are or can be called saints. Now be careful with what you do with that uh, in terms of how you view others or how you view yourself if you're struggling or if they're struggling with the word of wisdom. Because if you take that and go, hey, this should be a cakewalk. Uh, these principles and the promises attached are adapted to the weakest. Well, how does that make someone feel if they're struggling with the word of wisdom? Wait, I'm weaker than the weakest of saints? I remember doing high jump in high school. And the, the bar can only be lowered so far. And on its lowest level, I mean, it's barely higher than the, than the pit, the big pad that you get to fall into. You understand what I'm trying to say here? For someone who's wrestling with their own physical appetite, if they've struggled, especially with, the, with addictions to tobacco or to alcohol or to coffee or tea or to drugs or to opioids or to anything like it, don't feel like, like you're worse than the worst. Don't feel that you're weaker than the weakest. It's interesting when he says those who are saints or who can be called saints. Do you remember what the definition of saint is? Uh, a sinner who keeps on trying. Well, if you're struggling with these addictive chemicals, then keep on trying. And even if you fall or fail, and you, you grapple with that sinner side of things, as long as you keep trying, 
then you're a sinner who keeps on trying. In other words, you're a saint. And you deserve to be called one because you're trying. My wife is an addiction recovery counselor. Her sister is as well. And to see those two, talk about a dynamic duo. I was just with them both hiking this morning. And the whole time they're just talking about how do we help people better to overcome their addictions? How do we give them hope? Uh, my sister-in-law, in fact, said, that, whoa, we're spirit, world, we're spirit prison missionaries. That's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to convince people that you can be freed of this bondage. The, the path has been cleared for you. The way is possible. You just have to believe in this. And, and paradise is just on the other side of your mental prison. Once you have the hope that you can escape. When she told me that, I'm like, that is genius. You're about to get quoted. Uh, and, and, and we'll see it most clearly in section 138. But I feel like it, it fits so beautifully right here in section 89. Don't feel like you're weaker than the weakest. Just keep trying. And as long as you will keep trying, then you're a saint. And you will ultimately be able to fulfill this principle and receive its associated promises. I know that's true. My own grandfather came home from World War II with, with major challenges. It's one of the things, he, he's my poster boy for the dangers of a draft because he didn't have a military bone in his body. My other grandpa that was drafted, he handled World War II just fine. This grandpa, it, it destroyed him through no fault of his own. But he came home with this kind of baggage and, and it led to word of wisdom issues in terms of tobacco and alcohol. It led to divorce and, and leaving the church and all of those things. Well, the story all has, the, those parts of the story all have happy endings, I'm grateful to say. But when it came to word of wisdom, he, could eas he fairly easily gave up alcohol. Though to his dying day, he kept saying, I really miss wine. I'm like, overshare, Grandpa. I didn't need to know that. Uh, but when it came to cigarettes, he used to say, I quit smoking every Sunday, which lets you know how things went from Sunday to Sunday. Until it got to a point that for Grandpa, it was, it was looking at something like verse 3 and saying, I'm weaker than the weakest of the saints, so I don't deserve to be a saint, so why am I even trying to live up to that standard? I'll never be able to reach it. And it wasn't until he did hit literal rock bottom with that and, and admitted to the Lord, I am powerless to overcome that. By the way, that's one of the key steps in the 12-step program, part of this addiction recovery. Bill W. is, a, is the patron saint uh, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he is a saint in so many ways as he reassured people they can keep on trying but you have to admit you can't do it on your own. In some ways, it's, a, it's an acceptance of the status of the weak and the weakest of all saints. And once you internalize that, once you can truly confess that need, then you can tap into a higher source, someone saintlier than anyone who's ever lived. And, and as we admit that, as my grandpa admitted that, one of the greatest miracles of his life occurred the next morning when after years of, of addiction and after so many failed attempts of giving up smoking every Sunday, the next morning he arose and looked at his pack of cigarettes with abhorrence. I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. And he gave that gift to my grandpa and, had, and was never tempted by it again. Now, whether the miracle comes from God by way of removing the temptation or whether it comes by infusing with you, you with the strength to, to say no every time, if grace is sufficient for your day, then, then you are a saint and far from the weakest one. I just want to honor the effort of those who are trying and even failing, but determining to try, try again. It's worth the wrestle. You can win this. Keep fighting. Now, verse 4, and this is where the official revelation began originally. Behold, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, 
I have warned you and forewarned you by giving unto you this word of wisdom by revelation. I am amazed by that introductory verse. He doesn't just come in and say, uh, I'm trying to help you with your, with your physical health. So here's some do's and don'ts. His bigger concern is what they're up against, evils and designs that come from conspiring men. I'm warning you about them. And I'm forewarning you about them, which means the problem exists already. There's warn. And it's only going to get worse. There's forewarn. You've got to be able to overcome these challenges now. You've got to learn this word of wisdom coming by revelation because it will only become more and more challenging and well, more and more important because what you're up against will become more and more insidious. Evils will grow. Designs will improve. Conspiring men will proliferate. And you need to be awake and aware. With that in mind, I think we can expand the dangers of the word of wisdom far beyond uh, a, a drink of beer or a smoke from a cigarette. I mean, think about conspiring men. That it's not just the substances the Lord is focusing the saints' attention on, but, but the source of those substances, the people that are packaging and promoting them, those with evil intentions and designs toward your own addiction so that they can trap you, enslave you to those substances and ultimately to them as you become reliant upon them. I'm not just talking about some, some shady drug dealer in some back alley somewhere. I'm talking about someone that, that, that dresses in nice suit and tie but who is trying to drag you down in order to raise his bottom line. Think of advertising, marketing, packaging, promoting, product placement, celebrity endorsements, planned obsolescence, endless upgrades, monthly fees, sneaky subscriptions, early termination penalties, endless interest payments, you name it. All of this is playing into a consumer culture that leads us to deplete our soil, pollute our air, poison our water, enrich our abusers, and exploit our fellow man. It's one of the reasons that when John describes Babylon in the last days, yes, it's a beast, there's the political manifestation. Yes, it's this, this whore and this false prophet, there's the religious or, or ideological manifestation. But it's also this merchant city, and that's the economic aspect. So much of, of what is driving of our personal addictions, as far as the word of wisdom concerned, is, is physical appetite. But what's driving it on their side, that's the, that's the consumer side, but on the producer side, it's the economics of it all. And I hinted about this verse earlier, but I do believe it's worth actually reading. In the book of Revelation, as it describes this merchant city and walks you through the catalog of what they're offering, Revelation 18, 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyine wood, all manner vessels of ivory, all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. I mean, trade those out for anything you might see associated with the word of wisdom. Instead of gold and silver and precious stones, it could be alcohol and tobacco and drugs. Instead of, of wood and ivory and, and brass, it could be any type of substance you might grow addicted to, from energy drinks or caffeine down to, to chocolate or sugar. That's where I start feeling guilty. <laughs> I've got a sweet tooth that I've got to overcome. And it's not the substances themselves that I'm trying to draw attention to. I'm not trying to expand the list uh, interminably uh, of what we have in section 80, 89. And I, I see the church itself backing away from that. I mean, look at BYU and when they began stocking caffeinated soft drinks uh, in, in the school cafeterias. I mean, some people reacted to that like, like it's Armageddon, okay? This is, a, this is the sign of the times. Well, is it a sign of, of the Lord lowering his standard, or is it simply a sign of the Lord giving you the responsibility to determine what I mean, to take personal accountability and responsibility. The power is in you. You are agents unto yourselves. So rather than being an object being worked upon, be or acted upon, be an agent 
and choose to act. And, and are you able to handle this or is it handling you? Because if it's the one in control instead of you, then that is against the word of wisdom. No matter how, how ostensibly harmless the substance might be, that's what takes me back to this, this passage in Revelation 18. Because after listing all of those items in verse 12, it gets closer to the actual goal in 13. Okay, well, keep, let's keep lulling them into this false sense of security. Let's keep reeling them in. Just turn the page. Here's a few more items in our catalog. Cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And that's what, what the adversary has been after all along. Everything else is just to get you to turn pages. Everything else is just to coax you into the door. And our, our commercialism and our consumerism I mean, in some ways, the gold and silver and precious stones are just, we call them gateway drugs. If I can start with something soft and then move you towards something, the more demanding, I mean, that's drug addiction uh, par excellence, that it begins with something and it, oh, and you just have this high, but then it fades and now you need something stronger and stronger and stronger until you are so trapped by your own addictions. Turn enough pages, bend enough rules, Remove enough barriers, and ultimately you will find what the adversary has been after all along, what these evil and designing men have been conspiring towards from the very beginning. It's slaves and souls of men that they're after. Regardless of what they're trying to sell, the ultimate thing they're trying to buy is you. And that's what we have to be aware of, what we have to be warned and forewarned about. An avaricious commercialism, peddling and pushing and insatiable consumerism, a culture of desire that can never be satisfied, of covetousness rather than contentment. It's not reduce, reuse, and recycle for so many. It's distract, discard, and replace. And that way the money keeps on flowing. How far away are we from the old pioneer motto of use it up and wear it out, make it do or do without? You see how all encompassing the word of wisdom can be as far as what it's warning us against? I mean, go back to section 38, where the law of consecration was first introduced in the context of battling that that conspicuous consumption, that commercialism and consumerism. The way he said it then, the enemy in the secret chambers seeketh your lives. That could be your economic lives, your social lives, your psychological lives, your physical lives. Enemies in secret chambers sound like conspiring men motivated by evil and design. Section 38 goes on, ye hear of wars in far countries. That was what section 87 was all about. You say there will soon be great wars in far countries, but ye know not the hearts of men in your own land. I mean, I always used to think that meant civil war. And yes, it does. But really what he's after is, do you understand what's going on right here at home with the rampant get rich quick ism that's, that's spreading across the United States? And from there, spreading across the world, the Yankee peddler, the, the snake oil salesman, the land speculator, those, the, the gambler, the riverboat gambler, those all became almost stock characters in, in 19th century America. You find them in a lot of Mark Twain novels, for example. Uh, that's the, the day that these saints are, are living in. And sadly, it's still the day that we live in ourselves. So what's the Lord say in section 38? Now I show unto you a mystery and if it's a mystery, then it's going to take divine words of wisdom to solve it. A thing which is had in secret chambers. So it'll take a revelation to bring those hidden things to light. It's meant to bring to pass even your destruction in process of time. Oh, it's so gradual that it's difficult to detect. And ye knew it not, the Lord says there. And here in section 89, he's trying to help them know it. I am giving you this word of wisdom. 
by revelation as a warning and forewarning so that you're aware of the evils and designs of conspiring men in the last days. I mean, I remember years ago reading an article in a magazine about the McGriddle, which was McDonald's latest invention of a breakfast sandwich. And, and what was amazing about the McGriddle, and they were tasty, I'll admit it, uh, was that it, it was, instead of, of like English muffins, it was pancakes that became what you were holding. And the pancakes had, had syrup flavoring. But that was the question. And that was what this article was trying to, to describe was, how do you make uh, pancakes taste like syrup, but not be sticky on your fingers since you're holding it? And I was like, huh. That's a good point. I wouldn't want sticky fingers after I'm done, but I do like the, the syrupy taste. So, man, that, that's an interesting problem to solve. And the article described how they solved it. And, and it was an eye opener to realize, whoa, we have shifted. And this is what the article said, that food is more engineered than simply grown. It's designed rather than simply cooked. And that work is done in labs more than in kitchens by chemists more than by cooks. Wow, we are a far cry from, from a family sitting around the dinner table eating crops that they just gathered or, or harvested from outside. I mean, it, and I'm not saying we have to go back to those days, okay? I am saying that we need to be aware and awake. We need to be warned and forewarned. Because it's not just that what we own ends up owning us, but in a weird way, sometimes what we eat ends up eating us. What we drink ends up being the dregs of a bitter cup. So in this warning and forewarning, where does the Lord begin? Verse 5, what was most obvious to the, uh, to the surrounding the people and, and the needs for all of these temperance movements. He begins with alcohol. Verse 5, that inasmuch as any man drinketh wine or strong drink among you, behold, it is not good neither meet in the sight of your Father, only in assembling yourselves together to offer up your sacraments before him. And even then, verse 6, Behold, this should be wine, yea, pure wine of the grape of the vine of your own make. I mean, we saw that back in section 27, when Joseph was going out to obcure, obtain wine for the sacrament, and he stopped on the journey and said, No, 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 do not buy wine of your enemies. Make it yourself. Now, part of making it yourself would most likely be, well, is that just grape juice then? Or is that wine with such a low alcohol content that it's, that it's not going to be an issue? Especially when you're taking a tiny sip as part of the sacrament. But I'm even more interested by the way he phrased it. Don't buy it of your enemies. And I think so often in, in context of evil and design uh, and conspiring men, I think so much of this is, is there an enemy ship behind this? If they're trying to addict me to something, if they're trying to enslave me to them, and that's not a friend. That, that, that's, it's not friendship that is motivating them. That, that I can't buy those things of mine enemies. I mean, like it says here, let it be of your own make, which to me teaches a, a beautiful principle also. If it's your own make, it's like you're in control of it. You know what went into it. You know what's coming out of it. You know how long it's been there, what, what, how much fermentation, whatever. It's, it's under your control. You're controlling it instead of it or them controlling you. And I think that's an important principle to understand in, in terms of the word of wisdom in general also. I'm not saying you can't go to the grocery store or the restaurant and buy things that other people have made. Uh, I, I'm not saying that everything has to be from scratch, but, but the idea behind of your own make, I just love the, the possible principle to, to pull out. Am I in control of the things that I consume? Or are those things consuming me? Because if that's the case, then it's not good. It's not meat in the sight of your father. Now, like he said at the end of five and into six, there is a purpose for those things. And we'll see that more with some of the other to don'ts also. That I've heard some people kind of mock the word of wisdom and say, well, if it's bad, then why would God make it? And I'm like, well, it's not bad the way he made it. It's bad the way that we have altered the use or the intention. And you get a sense of that in verse seven. Again, strong drinks are not for the belly, but for the washing of your bodies. 
I mean, there you think rubbing alcohol, right? You, I mean, a substance that, yeah, uh, alcohol. But man, you'd be pretty far gone if that's, I have to get my alcohol fixed somewhere and, that, and that's what you're turning to. No, alcohol in general, that's the Lord's designed use. Wash yourself with it. No, 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 no don't drink the stuff. In fact, when my, when my youngest son was little, there was a bottle of hydrogen peroxide on the counter. I think it had been used to, to disinfect toothbrushes after an, an illness or something. Well, he was little and he like chugged this cup full of hydrogen peroxide. I'm thinking, how do you not know that's not meant for human consumption after the first, after it first hits your mouth or down your throat? He's like oblivious, just glug, 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 glug. And when we found it, it was, I mean, calling poison control and rushing him to the hospital. I mean, thankfully he, he came out okay. Yeah, he was so little that later, once he understood what he did, he'd just kind of go up to people and go, I drank poison. And that, that's still our joke to him to this day, is how oblivious, I drink poison. Well, there are still people drinking poison where, no, no, that's not what it was intended for. It's not supposed to go in. It's just supposed to cleanse the out. You see the same, a similar thing with tobacco in verse 8. Again, tobacco, it's not for the body. Not, not, don't use it in that way. It's not for the belly. It's not good for man. Well, what's it good for then? Well, he'll tell us. It is an herb for bruises and all sick cattle to be used with judgment and skill. Now, I don't think all those old Marlboro man ads put him on a horse as some rugged cowboy because he was using all of that tobacco to, to help his herd. No. Uh, that, that, that smoking tobacco, you could include vaping with that. And so many of these other, those other aspects... They're not used for their intended purpose. And again, the last phrase expands it beyond just the, the, the topic at hand. It's meant to be used with judgment and with skill. That, I think, helps us understand something about opioids or, or drugs that are not illegal, but still need to be used with judgment and with skill. We need to be incredibly careful in, in, with those things. Beware that as they're healing you from one thing, that they're not harming you with something else. Curing one disease only to, to trap you in something worse. In verse 9, again, hot drinks are not for the body or belly. And in that time period, we're not talking hot chocolate. In that time period, the two hot drinks that ever was, everyone knew what those were referring to. And that was coffee and tea. And it was less about the temperature than it was about the contents particularly the, the addictive nature of those contents. And with that, the Lord ends the, the to don't list of the word of wisdom, the prohibitions. But I hope we don't confine ourselves to those, thinking that, hey, if it's not on the list, then it must be okay. Because it's like King Benjamin, when he says, I can't list all the possible ways that you could sin, okay? It, it, it's, it's endless. And, and people seem to be creative these days, especially conspiring men. So, Understand the principle with promise and follow those principles. I think it was President Hinckley that even said, almost joking, well, yeah, the word of wisdom doesn't say to jump off a cliff either. But there are certain, be wise. It's a word of wisdom after all. It's a principle, not just a, a, a program. And so what principles are, is this teaching us? Beware of things that are used against their intended purposes. Beware of things that impair your judgment and skill. Beware of things that harm your body or that impair your agency. Be sure to control the things that might end up controlling you. We are meant to act, not be acted upon. And it's interesting that so often we, we act in ways that a substance ends up being the, the one that's really in control. I mean, to me, it's always been interesting. What, what fraction of the population needs some th substance to get out of bed and then another substance to go back to sleep at the end of the day? And it's like, I, I, are we ever off of chemicals in, in between them? I got to get my cup of joe in the morning to get going and I got to drink my, my, my can of beer at night to get back down. I remember hearing that from friends at Divinity School. They're like, wait, wait, you have a full-time job besides full-time PhD work and you're not allowed to drink coffee? How do you do this? And I just laugh and go, oh, well, I, 
sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of our bodies, right? Said oath and covenant of the priesthood. We just keep going. There is something to be said. I mean, what's that phrase that was used about the church as far as it's to be independent above? I would love physically and mentally, with a body and mind invigorated by natural substances, uh, by getting enough sleep and getting enough exercise and, and eating what's right and, and nutrition and health and all those kinds of things, so that I'm independent above chemical needs, artificial needs. Again, again, I'm far from perfect in this area, but I am a, a sinner who keeps on trying. I'm working on getting enough sleep. I'm, I'm working on getting better exercise. I'm working on eating more healthily. And I'm grateful for the results that I'm feeling. That's what you see in, in much of the rest of Section 89, the, the do's of the Word of Wisdom. And like I said earlier, perhaps we need to do a little less patting ourselves on the back for complying with the don'ts if we're not complying with the do's. Verse 10, again, verily I say unto you, all wholesome herbs God hath ordained for the constitution, nature, and use of man. The constitution, I and mean, we think of that of, oh, that's what governs the United States or whatever country has a constitution. Well, the constitution, what, what constitutes our bodies and our minds? Do we, do we see it as, as a, a law book of sorts? Something that helps us understand how we're supposed to, to feed our bodies, invigorate our minds. It's for that constitution. It's for our nature. It's for our use. Verse 11, every herb in the season thereof and every fruit in the season thereof, all these to be used with prudence and thanksgiving. Now with global supply chains and refrigerated shipping containers, uh, chances are the, it, fruit is always in season somewhere in the world. Uh, and you can get it. It's not a matter of, uh oh, it's not strawberry season, so you shouldn't be eating that. I mean, if eating, if eating fruit out of season in that way is, is ranked on, on the catalog of sins, I think that's about as, as, that's probably the last one we have to overcome before God can finally pronounce us perfect. But like I said, in the world today, I think we're getting closer to what we, that verse in Revelation we read last week about the, the tree of life there in, the, in John's vision of the book of Revelation that it yields 12 manner of fruits and it does it every month. Okay, so that, that kind of fruit is always in, in season. That's no wonder they can accept it and, and partake of it in prudence and thanksgiving. Are we grateful for the things that God has? It just grows out of the earth. I always thought about that in terms of the Garden of Eden. It, they're in, not yet cast out so that by the sweat of your brow do you have to eat bread all the days of your life. It just grows. But honestly, I remember on my mission, a tropical island there in the Caribbean, and we'd be walking through the countryside and orange trees and, and fruit trees. Just, it grew. There were mangoes just dropping off of trees and rotting in the streets. Now, not, I don't want to eat the rotten one in the street. That's, that's definitely out of season. But it was amazing how it, it just was there. And to be able to, to pick it off a tree and to partake of it with thanksgiving. I hope we approach the gifts that God has given us through nature with both of those, prudence and thanksgiving. Verse 12, Yea, flesh also of beasts and of the fowls of the air, I the Lord have ordained for the use of man with thanksgiving. Nevertheless, they are to be used sparingly. Now here I recognize I may be walking on thin ice for some people. And having lived in Texas for seven years and Tennessee for eight, I've got 15 years of southern barbecue in me. Uh, and so I have to be careful with what I say about this. When it comes to eating meat, often we tend to either extreme. We either make it the, the broad base of our own personal food pyramid, and that is like, wait, there was no meat in this meal. What? It doesn't even count. I don't even feel like I've eaten. Well, that's a problem, uh, that extreme. The opposite extreme comes when we hold others to the opposite extreme. It's fine to choose vegetarianism or veganism for oneself, but to force it upon other people, that goes against the word of wisdom as well. I mean, we saw that back in section 49, where those missionaries were sent to the Shakers, because that was something that they believed in. But holding other people to that standard was not the will of God. I mean, here, meat is ordained for the use of man. In section 49, Whoso forbiddeth to abstain from meats, that man should not eat the same, is not ordained of God. 
Now the syntax of that verse is a little tricky. But if you forbid people to eat meat, if you force them to abstain, if you make it your clarion call and commandment, you should not eat the same. That, that isn't ordained of God. God has given man dominion over the, the beasts of the, of the earth and the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea. They are meant to be used with judgment and skill, with, with prudence and with thanksgiving. And, and this is the part that, I mean, if you're a meat eater and you're like, yeah, you take that, you, you vegans. Well, I, don't overswing the pendulum. That's why he says at the end of 12, they are to be used sparingly. In fact, I find it fascinating to compare. I mean, there were two creations, so to speak, in Genesis. Two first men and women. There was Adam and Eve with the first creation, but then there was Noah and his wife with the second. And a new beginning after the flood. And in both instances, there are some verses that speak of, of humanity's dominion over the animals. But compare the two, and post-flood, it's a harsher dominion. It's, it speaks of animals fearing man. It's the fear of man, the dread of man. And that's interesting. I mean, to, to see how animals are treated in order to, to satisfy our, our far from sparing consumption of them. No wonder there is fear and dread. Uh, I mean, you're not human, so you don't have to, we don't have to be humane toward you. But that's not what God intends for his creation either. I just... I just think we need, I don't think, I, I read section 89 and I know, we just need to be mindful. We need to be uh, purposeful. We need to be intentional in terms of how we treat the earth and how we treat our bodies and how we treat the animals and how we treat plants. And how, I mean, again, so much of the evils and designs of conspiring men is it's what's ruining our planet and ruining our bodies ruining our mental and physical health, worn and forewarn. No, I can't say what sparingly means. That's going to be up to you. And like I said, if this is a, it's not commandment or constraint yet, grow into understanding, grow into accountability. If this is a word of wisdom, it's, it's order, it's will, but, but there's a lot of wiggle room here. I mean, honestly, we saw that phrase crowned with commandments, not a few back in section 59, in terms of the Sabbath day. And I can't think of a better place to, to understand commandments, not a few, uh, and, and tailored tenets and personalized principles than in, in the Sabbath day and how you observe it. But if I had to pick a second place, it would probably be how we treat our bodies. Because if this is kind of lowest common denominator, let me at least spell out some, some, some clear don'ts. Let's get rid of alcohol, coffee, tea, tobacco, and, and harmful drugs, okay? Let's be, that one I want to be as, as obvious as I can. But with these other things, I'm going to allow you to act on wisdom. I'm going to let you choose for yourself. I'm, I'm hoping that you will be open to revelation and to commandments, not a few, to crown you with. And remember, those are personalized principles, not ones that you preach from the pulpit. When it comes to how I keep the Sabbath day holy, or better said, how the Lord has taught me to live so that the Sabbath day can keep me holy, those are things I don't preach from the pulpit. I don't, I don't film and, and post on YouTube. Those are things that God has taught me, and they've made a difference. And so when it comes to, to keeping the word of wisdom, not breaking it, I think there's a, a whole level, if this is the weak and the weakest, if it's at this level, that means there's a lot of room to grow, to grow into greater understanding, to grow into to higher levels of living, to grow up in God, and to be intentional and mindful in terms of the way we choose to live it for ourselves. I realize this is, this is sensitive, tricky territory for a lot of people. In fact, there's a, a whole fight throughout much of church history based on a punctuation mark in verse 13. Right on the heels of, of it should be used sparingly, the Lord continues, it is pleasing unto me that they should not be used, comma, only in times of winter or of cold or famine. Now, there are those on one extreme that want to change the comma after used into an exclamation point and then erase the rest of the, the, the verse. 
it would be better. It's more pleasing to the Lord. Just don't use it at all. But that goes against what we saw in 12. It goes against what we saw in section 49. It goes against the, some of the things we saw in, was it section 57 or 58? Can't remember. Uh, that these things were given unto the, by the Lord unto us for our, thank, for our rejoicing. To please the eye, to gladden the heart. And prudence and thanksgiving, it's all there. But there's others, other extreme that want to get rid of the comma entirely and just say, hey, it's pleasing unto God that they shouldn't be used only in times of winter or of cold or of, or of famine. As if to say, you see, they shouldn't be used only then. He's, he's not trying to get us to limit ourselves just to winter or cold or famine. We should be able to use them any time of year under any circumstances. Now, those who want to, to push in that direction, you see, you see we're at either extreme of this. Maybe there's a contrary to be proven here as well. But those on that extreme of more meat, as opposed to the, the less meat side, do have a leg to stand on insofar as there was no comma when it was originally published. Now don't jump to the conclusion that we're wrong then, because it came down by decision by the presiding quorums of the, of the church in the, 18, excuse me, the 1921 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants to clarify the doctrine by inserting that comma. Evidently, there were too many people in the church at the time that were reading it without it and using that, that the syntax or the, the lack of punctuation mark to justify going against the spirit of all the verses that surrounded it. It's like, no, he just said to use it sparingly. Come on. It's like you that are like, well, well quit saying that we have to limit ourselves just to, to winter or famine or cold. And we have published other editions of the Doctrine and Covenants since 1921, which means the Brethren have had opportunity after opportunity to, to get rid of the, I mean, they're aware of the, the so-called comma controversy too. And they could have gotten rid of it in, in later editions. But again, see all these all the Re Doctrine and Covenants revelations we've seen so far on this topic, and there is some middle ground that we need to find for ourselves. What is sparing? In the 1830s, when this was received with lack of refrigeration and so on, there was, it was safer to eat meat during cold and winter. It does provide uh, an incredible amount of calories during those time periods or during periods of famine. I'm sure there will be those that will say, oh, it's always winter somewhere, or man, I'm a little cold, or I'm famished. It is my time of famine or winter or cold, so load me up. And, and, go, and they go against the spirit of this word of wisdom, of being mindful, of being prudent, of having judgment and wisdom, of being in control of ourselves. And like I said, it's far above my pay grade, <laughs> far above my head, to prescribe anything for you when it's meant to be something that you and the Lord will come together on. And to be open to adjustments over time based on his continually commanding us, crowning us with commandments, not a few. He told us the minimum. He didn't tell us the maximum, at least not to the collective body of the saints. I'll leave you and him to discuss the particulars. Okay. Now, moving on, verse 14. All grain, we're still on the to-dos, all grain is ordained for the use of man and of beasts to be the staff of life. So that should be the broadest base of the food pyramid, okay? the staff of life. Not only for man, but for the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven and all wild animals that run or creep on the earth. And throughout most of human history, there hasn't been much of an, an option other than that. Grain as the staff of life, the, the main source of most of our carbohydrates. Verse 15, and these hath God made for the use of man only in times of famine and excess of hunger. Now that one can be confusing also. Yeah, it's like whenever he uses only, it's like, do we need some more punctuation here? Because if we read it as, oh, it was made for the use of man, but only in times of famine and excess of hunger. It's like, wait a minute, wait. So in, in times of famine, that's only when I can eat meat. But according to 15, it's only when I can eat grain too. Well, what am I supposed to eat the rest of the year? No, it's don't do man, comma, only in times. Rather, you should say use of man only, comma. Again, I don't want to start another comma controversy, but if we needed one in verse 15, put it after only, not before it. 
Because back in verse 14, when it said, oh, grain is not just for man, it's for beasts also. It's like, hmm, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that my horse would prefer oats to grazing grass out in the field. And it, to me, it suggests this, this loving care from a father in heaven who cares about all of his creation, including the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. Uh, best case scenario, let them eat the good stuff too. <laughs> let them enjoy the staff of life. I mean, you don't have to put up a scarecrow all the time because the birds seem to enjoy that, that, that kind of grain. Don't force your livestock only to graze. Give them the good stuff when you can afford to. You see in verse 15, if there's times of famine or excess of hunger, then you'll need to reserve your grain for your family and not just for your livestock. You see, they can graze. You can't. And they, again, to me, this is part of that prudence coupled with thanksgiving. When things are abundant and, and you can be thankful for that, then share. I mean, in the Old Testament, it was like, don't even, don't harvest the corners of your fields. Allow the poor to come and glean. Provide for them. I've made the world abundant. There is enough and to spare. But in times where that's not the case, times where it's not quite so easy to live with thanksgiving and much more important to live with prudence, then with your judgment, with your skill, reserve grain for your family. Let your livestock be out in the fields grazing on the grass. Verse 16, still on grain. All grain is good for the food of man, as also the fruit of the vine, that which yieldeth fruit, whether in the ground or above the ground. So there we don't, we don't just have grains, but we also get fruits and vegetables. I mean, honestly, we could create the food pyramid just from <laughs> section 89. The broad base is grain, the staff of life. Well, above that, now we get the, the fruit of the vine. We get that which is growing in the ground or above the ground. There's vegetables, there's fruit. Above that, we're going to have meat sparingly. I mean, it belongs on the food pyramid. It just doesn't belong on the bottom of it. Okay, it belongs on the top. Then 17, I've seen some people take this to an extreme and as if it was limited or confined to this. I don't, I don't think that's what he's doing. Verse 17, nevertheless... Wheat for man, corn for the ox, oats for the horse, rye for the fowls, and for swine, and for all beasts of the field, and barley for all useful animals, and for mild drinks, as also other grain. Now, those that want to take this too specifically will say something like, oh, corn, I'm not supposed to eat that. That's only for my oxen. Oats, nope, can't have any oatmeal in the morning because that's, I'm, I'm not a horse. I don't think the Lord is being that specific I think what he's trying to get at is there are some foods that are designed better for certain species. And again, there's a sense of judgment and skill there. There's a sense of, of mindfulness and intentionality there. And like he admits at the end, that even barley can be used for mild drinks. The earlier he talked about strong drinks, there's a high alcohol content and so on. But as a mild drink, now this doesn't sound very appetizing to me, but back in the 1800s, they did a popular drink was barley water. It was non-alcoholic. It was a mild drink. They just uh, soak barley in water and then kind of skim it off and, and drink that. I mean, I'm not trying to eliminate every other possibility here. You can be creative in your, in your culinary possibilities. Just be wise. This is a word of wisdom after all. And what I love about this wisdom on the Lord's part is honestly, this is a sustainable way of living. This is not a diet fad. There are so many of those. I actually went online because I, I had a bunch floating around in my head. You know, there's keto and there's paleo and there's Atkins and there's Weight Watchers and there's South Beach. And there's, there's so, I mean, I went online to just see, you know, possible fad diets out there. And I came, I found one website that an article and it said a hundred different diets and which is, which is the best way to lose weight. And I was like, a hundred different diets? Hello. And no wonder there's so much argument out there. And, oh, no, this is the one you got to try. And, and, oh, carbs are horrible. Or, or oh, it's all got to be carbs. And it's like, what? I don't know. And there is there's science and there's pseudoscience out there. I think a lot of it depends on what are you trying to seek. Are you trying to build muscle mass? Are you, are you trying to lose weight? There are so many options out there easy to get lost in. What I love about the simplicity 
21 verses. That's all we get in section 89. The simplicity of this sustainable way of living. Now, I'm not going to get into all the, the specific uh, health benefits uh, or the, I mean, I have received some amazing emails from students, from some of you describing the, the miracles that have happened in their lives physically, overcoming diseases and so on, because of a, an incredibly strict adherence to kind of almost the, I don't know, I, I hesitate to call it the letter of the law of the Word of Wisdom, because for so many of those of you that, that have shared things with me, there is such a spirit of the law behind what you're doing that, that I take my hat off to you. I actually remember a friend who was diagnosed with diabetes later in life, and the doctor was ready to just close the door and all kinds of things, and this good brother just said, can I please just have another chance and a little more time before you finalize this diagnosis? He realized, I don't think I've been living the word of wisdom as well as I need to. I've been adhering to all the don'ts, but not to the do's. Uh, I've been keeping the letter of the prohibition, but not the spirit of the, uh, of the recommendation. And I, I just pray it's not too late. And he became much more serious, much more intentional, much more mindful of, of his body, of being in control, of being judicious, of having judgment and skill, of, of keeping the principle baking on the promise, and the promises came. And I don't know, six months later, whatever it was, he went back to the doctor, and the doctor was like, whoa, what did you do? Because we don't need to make this diagnosis anymore. Uh, and, and there have been other stories I've heard from many of you that even go above and beyond that with miraculous things taking place in your lives physically because you are approaching not just the words of the word of wisdom, but rather approaching the author of the word of wisdom himself and seeking his guidance of how do we help our children with these chronic illnesses or how do, we, how do I navigate life with this new, this new health, these constraints and challenges that I'm facing. I do believe that there are answers here that will come to you through the gift of the Holy Ghost. And like I said, I'll leave the two of you to discuss them. What I'm most amazed by are the last four verses. Because as you said earlier, these are principles with promise. Well, here are the promises, and they're incredible. Especially in the fact that they go far beyond the, the solely physical aspect. Remember, it was to invigorate your body and your mind. Remember, the body is an essential component of the soul. But the spirit is the other half of that. And so all under the umbrella of the spiritual, this is not just a temporal commandment. So beyond the temporal promise, notice what the Lord says. All saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments. Now, I thought you said it wasn't by commandment or constraint. Well, we'll get there. Okay. In obedience to the commandments. What's the promise? They shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones. Now, so far, this seems more physical than anything else. I remember on my mission when I read that, and it was a salud and, and el ombligo. And I remember, th well, oh, that must be health in the navel. But I had learned the word ombligo, and I knew it was the word for belly button. And for whatever reason, I mean, that's what the navel is. The navel is your belly button. But because it's kind of poetic, and I've been raised it with the English phrase, I never actually thought about my belly button. I mean, if that's the way it had been spelled out, you will receive health in your belly button. I think we'd all be scratching our heads. Like, wait, what? But to think about the belly button, and again, ombligo, oh, umbilical cord. Maybe that must be have the same, I don't know, Latin root. And to think about what a baby, how a baby is nourished through the umbilical cord, to the ombligo, to the navel, to the belly button. It's, I wonder if the Lord is being symbolic there to suggest health in the navel. Well, if you'll trust me, if you'll be an infant in the womb again and allow me to nourish you, just like you did your, in the womb, then there will be health in your navel. Your entire body will be blessed. I get a similar sense from the marrow in their bones. Since bone marrow and and blood cells are, are such a source of the entire body's health. 
So don't be too literal <laughs> with health in the navel and marrow in the bones. Be more symbolic that if you'll remember these things, if you'll keep them and do them, if you'll walk, if you'll follow my word of wisdom, you will be healthy. It's almost like an eye single, the whole body filled with light. If you'll keep these words of wisdom, your whole body will have health. Now shift from the physical to the spiritual in verse 19. And you shall find wisdom. It is a word of wisdom after all. And great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. And this is where the word of wisdom becomes spiritual and not just physical. This is why it came by revelation and not just in a, an article from the Journal of the American Medical Association. To me, one of the best places to, to ponder this is in a, a phrase from the patriarchal blessing of President Boyd K. Packer. He shared this in a conference talk, and, and, and when he was young, heading off to World War II, and received his patriarchal blessing, it talked about the importance of caring for his body, the importance of keeping the word of wisdom. That would have saved my grandpa in World War II. Uh, but President Packer, the phrase that President Packer was, was given was that your body is the instrument of your mind and the foundation of your character. And President Packer later gave a whole talk on that, based on that. It's the, the, the body as the instrument of the mind. Remember that verse in section 88, that your body and mind might be invigorated. There's a connection between the two. I don't know about you, but when I'm physically healthy, my, my mind works better than, than it otherwise would. My, my spirit functions at, at closer to full strength. There's something that fasting does, for example, to clear out the, the physical fog, so to speak, and give me clearer access to the things of God. Same with exercise, same with a sufficient sleep. In, in my mind, it's almost like the old-fashioned old radio, and are you, are you tuning in, or you're just a little bit off? And there's something about keeping our, our bodies the way that they should, and a well-honed instrument, a well-tuned instrument. I mean, there's the, the tuning fork again. Am I, am I on some chemical to get me up in the morning and down in the night, and then there's other things in, in between throughout the day? Am I ever off of chemicals so that the Spirit can just speak to my soul? I do, I do want health in the navel and marrow in the bones. But to me, the even greater promise based on these principles are the spiritual gifts of revelation, of clarity of thought, of an ear attuned to the voice of God. I want those hidden treasures. I want that knowledge. And it does come largely through obedience to the word of wisdom, which then gives me a different perspective on verse 20 which throughout my life has always seemed, oh, now we're back to the physical. It's like 18 physical, 19 spiritual, 20, oh, back to the physical. Ah, uh, careful. Since we started with the physical and then brought in the spiritual, let's let them both continue hand in hand, shall we? Since both constitute the soul of man, and that's what the Lord is after. He wants to redeem our souls. He wants to resurrect our body. He wants body and spirit inseparably connected. So read verse 20 with that in mind. And they shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. Oh, those were Isaiah's words. He prefaced them with, with another, another echo of this thought. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, again, that, that's obvious when it comes to the physical side of things. I think I've said this in an earlier lesson, that every time I, I crouched in the starting blocks in track, I would pray for this. Heavenly Father, I don't want to do the 110 hurdles, especially on the 330 hurdles. I always joke with people, like, oh, I did, the two, I did the 220 hurdles. And they're like, what was that? There, was there a shorter race? I'm like, no, it was the 330s. It was just that last 100 yards that killed me. Uh, and so I pray, please let me run and not be weary and walk and not faint. I do keep the word of wisdom. Well, there is that aspect. But spiritually speaking, is there another level of running? How does... How does uh, the book of Hebrews say it, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There's something about tapping into the spiritual gifts of the word of wisdom, those hidden treasures and treasures of knowledge and wisdom that allow us to run with patience the spiritual race ahead. 
to remain unshaken in our faith, firm in our testimonies, because, because we're living according to God's higher law. It's amazing what comes of that. To walk and not faint, Ephesians encourages us to walk as children of light. Or as he says elsewhere, to pray always and not faint. I, I, like I said, I see physical manifestations of verse 20, but I, I prefer the spiritual ones to be included. I wonder if the same holds true of verse 21. And I, the Lord, give unto them a promise. This is a principle with promise again, that the destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. Amen. Now that takes us back to Passover. The blood of the lamb painting those doorposts so that the destroying angel passes over us and preserves our firstborn. It's what allows slaves to go free. It's what initiates our journey to a promised land. I mean, Passover is such a rich symbol. Well, if God is trying to free us from evils and designs and conspiring men, if he's trying to allow the destruction economic, physical, emotional, mental, uh, that that is rampant throughout these last days. How does he he help us? I mean, if you think about all the possible destroying angels that are out there, the word of wisdom with its physical and its spiritual promises will help us overcome all things. You see, I fear that sometimes non-members and even members approach the word of wisdom, especially with its don'ts, as purely a a physical law. We call it the Lord's law of health, after all. But it's so much more than that, at least more than physical health. Yeah, it's the Lord's law of health, but his physical health and its mental health and its spiritual health, which to me has helped me navigate some of the... Every once in a while, I'll see something on the internet where it's like, whoa, wine is good for you. And, and I hear, but you know, I'll have students or a bunch of other members will reach out and they're freaking out like, Joseph was wrong. And, and I saw something on the internet that says that the word of wisdom is, is flawed because wine's actually good for you. And I'm like, oh, wait for it, wait for it. And sure enough, a while later, there was another, I saw another uh, journal article or whatever that was like, oh, well, we actually found it was something in the skin of the grape that helped. It wasn't the alcoholic content. And people are like, oh, darn it, because I really wanted to go down that path. It's like, really? Come on. Are we looking for excuses to, and justifications? Or even be- better you know, motives, are we just limiting ourselves to the physical aspect of the word of wisdom? I've seen similar things with studies that are like, no, coffee's good for you, or a little of this, or... Again, there's, just like there's a million fad diets, there's, there all seems to be a, a million different perspectives on, on, the, on the health side, benefits or, or lack thereof, of the kinds of things mentioned in the Word of Wisdom. But to me, again, I think our mistake is limiting ourselves, confining ourselves to merely the physical, when it goes so far beyond that. Think of it in terms of the kosher laws, for example. If you were to reread you know, Leviticus and see all of the kosher laws, they are so strict I'm, it only took us 21 verses to finish the word of wisdom, okay? You read the kosher laws in the Old Testament, and they are, there are so many of them, and they're so specific about, well, does the animal chew the cud? Uh, is it, is it does, cloven hoofed? Uh, and, and it's like, wait, really? And I picture to myself, if I was an ancient Jew trying to live kosher laws, or, or Orthodox Jews today, to this day, I have to think really hard about anything I'm about to eat and picture like, how does this animal chew its food and what does its hooves look like? I'm like, seriously? And to me, again, are we thinking on the solely physical or are we allowing for making room for the spiritual? What does that do for a practicing Jew? Imagine them going to a restaurant, opening the menu, and looking at things, and not just thinking about biology class and what that animal looks like, but thinking of Scripture. Better yet, thinking of God. And how does God feel about the things I take into myself? Oh, that's a good conversation to have. That's something worth thinking about. You see, the way we do it is we, we bless the food. And, there, and there's, to me, something ironic there that we think that, well, why do we pray before meals? It was to bless the food. 
and I've joked about that before, you know, where it's, well, man, like, like the child said as they were helping their dad bring the, the groceries in from the car, and he said, Dad, let's just bless all the food here. Uh, it'll save a lot of time before meals. And Dad laughed and said, that's a great idea, son, but the food doesn't need to be blessed until after your mother cooks it. I mean, why not just go down to the grocery store and dedicate the place and we're done, right? Or, or pray over a farm. And, and no, it's not about changing the nature of the food. It's about changing the nature of the eater of the food. And since we don't tend to forget meals very often, if God can attach remembering him to remembering to eat, then we'll, we'll probably keep in touch. We'll probably pray often. You see what, what he's doing there? It's not about the food. It's about you. It's about remembering him. And so he attaches something that sadly is all too forgettable, namely our spirituality, our relationship with God, to something that is almost unforgettable, our physical needs. Well, picture that wonderful practicing Jew at a restaurant, looking at the menu, and instead of just thinking about their stomach, they're thinking about their Father in heaven. And how does he feel about what I'm about to partake of? That, to me, is a beautiful thing. That's spiritual, not just physical. Same with the Nazarites that are mentioned in the book of Numbers. If you take the kosher laws and then put them on steroids, if you take Jewish dietary practice and then raise it a notch, there you have the Nazarites. People like Samson was supposed to be. A Nazarite is someone that's living a higher law, sometimes permanently, sometimes for a, a specific period. In our day, we call them full-time missionaries. Uh, where, we, as members of the church, we all live a certain standard, but full-time missionaries live an even higher one for the, the period of their service. There's, there's things that aren't technically wrong, but it, they're wrong for them. They, they, don't, they don't go to movies. They don't watch TV. They don't listen to music. The rest of us can, and, and if it's appropriate, there's not a problem there at all. But for that period, it's a higher law. And in Numbers chapter 6, where the Nazarite vows are described, the word that keeps coming up is separate or separation. We would say set apart. When does a missionary start fully living into those rules? When he or she is set apart. You are different now. And to me, one of the great blessings of the word of wisdom, especially the fact that most of my non-member friends know the, at least the don'ts, is that it sets me apart. It's like, no, he's LDS, don't, don't even offer it to him. Or me, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a Latter-day Saint, and, and I don't partake of those things. And it, it, there is a separateness. There's a remembering God, but there's a distinction. And to me, that goes so far beyond anything that the American Medical Association can prove in one of their journals. It goes far beyond any, any fad diet or... Or science telling me that this is what's right or wrong for the body. It's like, well, no, I keep the word of wisdom for the body, but that's just the beginning. I keep it for the soul. I keep it because it helps me remember God. I keep, I keep it because it helps me discipline my, my lesser, baser nature. I keep it because it makes me different. And God could tell me something completely off the wall that has really no measurable health benefits. But if it helps me remember him, and if it helps me separate myself in a way that, that I can stand up and stand out in order to be a light to the world, then I'm all for it. That, to me, is part of the word of wisdom as well. Now, before we move on to the section 90, one last thing I want to say. I had an interesting like, two-hour Zoom call a couple of weeks ago with, with someone out in the world who had left his faith and left his belief in God and the church and everything else years ago. And it was interesting, he kept demanding almost this, give me a reason, I, I need a better explanation. The great, great person, uh, I've, I've known him for years, and uh, very intelligent, uh, very rational and scientific, and so wanted rational and scientific proof for God, for example. And there are those who would try to offer that, but there's skeptics that have tried to, that have torn down those kinds of evidences as well. Anyway, we had a, a fascinating conversation, but one of my big takeaways from it was, was kind of separating out these layers of belief or faith or testimony, and that there is a rationalist layer, uh, there is a pragmatist layer, 
And there's a spiritualist layer. Now there's, I'm sure, other layers we could add to the list as well. Social aspects of faith and psychological aspects of forgiveness, for example. There's a lot of good things that come. But it was interesting, kind of those big three. Rational, let's just keep it purely scientific. And from the Word of Wisdom's perspective, it would be, oh, something like science has shown that, that alcohol is, is, is a problem. Science has shown that, that tobacco, I mean, Surgeon General's warning, okay, it was that we didn't slap on a verse from Section 89 onto cigarette packets. But the government does slap on the Surgeon General's warning. They're, from a purely rationalist approach, this stuff will kill you. So avoid it will go to the pragmatist approach. And the pragmatist would say, oh yeah, it, this does just make me more healthy. Now there's some rationalism there too, but I remember when President Hinckley was interviewed on, on 60 Minutes and they, they brought up the word of wisdom and he said, oh yeah, UCLA did a study and Latter-day Saints on average live an extra decade over the general population. What, and how much is, is an extra 10 years of life worth to you? Now there's the pragmatic approach to things. You see, a rationalist wants to have proof for every part of their testimony. A pragmatist, on the other hand, I don't have to know all the reasons why it works. I just know that it works. And so that's good enough for me. The way I live my life as a Latter-day Saint, it just, I feel better about things. And I'm a better neighbor and I'm a better human being. That's, the proof is in the pudding. And that's the pragmatist. The spiritualist approach is, I've had God witness to my soul that these things are true. The Holy Ghost has borne witness that, that this is God's will and God's word and God's wisdom. It does something to connect me to him. That's on the, the, the kosher laws help me remember. That's the, the Nazarite vows help me be separate from the world and one with God instead. And you don't confine yourself to the word of wisdom in this. I was fascinated in this conversation just with where's, where does my testimony lie? And I do have a rationalist testimony. There are so many things about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ that just make sense. And there are certain things, for example, the, the thought that Joseph Smith just made up the Book of Mormon, that strikes me as, as completely irrational based on what I know about Joseph Smith and based on what I know about the Book of Mormon. But my testimony doesn't stop there. There's the rationalist side, the pragmatist. And I have a son that's, that we were talking the other day and he was just having a hard time wrapping his head around uh, around some deep doctrine. I mean, he's, he's 15, get, cut, cut him some slack, right? But he's like, I just don't, that doesn't make sense, or I don't understand this, and how does this work? And then, and we just finally settled down into, he was content for the time with his pragmatist testimony, that it works. Going to church does make me happy, and living the commandments does keep me free of those other kinds of issues in life that I see other people struggle with. And for now, his pragmatist testimony, and me, I've got a great pragmatist testimony of the gospel as well. But, like I said about my rationalist testimony, I'm glad it doesn't stand alone. I am so thankful for my spiritualist testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like the word of wisdom grants me treasures of knowledge and hidden treasures, just like it helps me remember God and helps me separate from, from worldly cares, the gospel of Jesus Christ as restored through Joseph Smith, it does something for me spiritually. Far beyond the pragmatics of a good life or the rationalist, I, I can't explain things in any other way. It's, I feel close to God. It grants me power and understanding and perspective, especially through difficult days. That's the real source of my faith and my hope and my charity. That to me is the ultimate revelation of reality as God sees it. It's what underwrites this word of wisdom and all the other words of wisdom that God has given us. And I'm so grateful for it. Now, with section 89 behind us, I want to hit section 90 and then 92. Because 92 is so brief and it has a similar audience to section 90. That audience are the members of the First Presidency, specifically the counselors in it. Uh, Joseph Smith has already been uh, sustained and, and ordained as president of the high priesthood. Back in section 81, 
We saw Jesse Gauss called as a counselor. Sidney Rigdon already was. Jesse Gauss is called. He then apostatizes and is excommunicated. And Frederick G. Williams is called in his place. That was Section 81. Well, Section 90 is the next step in organizing the First Presidency. And it's kind of, here are your marching orders, okay? Uh, this is going to be a presiding quorum of the church. It'll be another couple of years before they know about the next highest presiding quorum, namely the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. But here are the marching orders for those three, Joseph, Sidney, and Frederick. And the 92 is just two quick verses to Frederick uh, of what else your calling entails, since you're a little newer to it. In fact, anyone who's new to the First Presidency, I imagine reads very closely section 90. I don't know of a better revelation in scripture to help them understand more specifically what, what God wants them to do because of this high and holy calling. It begins in verse 1 with, thus saith the Lord. Verily, verily, I say unto you, my son, he's talking to Joseph specifically here first, thy sins are forgiven thee according to thy petition, for thy prayers and the prayers of thy brethren have come up unto my ears. It's amazing how often Joseph is reassured in the Doctrine and Covenants, I've forgiven you, which lets you know how often Joseph needed that reassurance. He was not perfect, but he was perfect at trying again. He was a sinner who kept on trying, which made him a saint. And like he said in Joseph's Smith History, don't take that admission to, to oh, paint the most deplorable pictures of me. I was not guilty of grave or malignant sins. That was never in my nature, okay? But he's forgiven according to thy petitions. You've been asking for that. You've been repenting. You've been praying for it. Others have been praying for it too. Verse 2, Therefore thou art blessed from henceforth, you that bear the keys of the kingdom given unto you, which kingdom is coming forth for the last time. I mean, this is an echo of Matthew 16, right, with Peter. And the rock upon which God will build his church as he gives him the keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Joseph Smith is given these keys of the kingdom as well. And as far as priesthood keys are concerned, it's the right to preside. To, to bear the responsibility to direct the work within your jurisdiction. A bishop has keys for his ward. And so that's why we were given permission from our bishops, from our stake presidents, within our ward, within our stake, to be able to officiate in the sacrament in our homes, for example, during COVID. And when COVID has, has decreased and we're able to go back to church, those keys are then turned in the opposite direction. and said, okay, you no longer have that permission. That's the presiding authority over the area. Well, the keys of the kingdom... Yes, that's for the prophet. And this revelation will say, and for the members of the first presidency, the three of them together share as they bear those keys of the kingdom. In verse 3, verily I say unto you, the keys of this kingdom shall never be taken from you while thou art in the world, neither in the world to come. Hmm, that's interesting. That Joseph Smith, for example, holding the keys of this last dispensation, he continues to hold them. Yes, they are shared with Brigham Young and John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff all, all the way down to Russell M. Nelson. But Joseph still holds those keys. Verse 4, Nevertheless, through you shall the oracles be given to another, yea, even unto the church. So as we saw with, with priesthood, it's more about the ordinances than about the ordination. It's more about the receivers of those ordinances rather than the givers, the holders of those authorities. So in this case, yes, Joseph, you have the keys of the kingdom, but it, that's only so that you can open the door so other people can receive these kinds of blessings, these kinds of oracles. In that famous 1828 dictionary, an oracle is defined as the communications, revelations, or messages delivered by God to prophets. Now, Noah Webster then clarified and said, well, I'll give you the ultimate example, the scriptures. But what I love about this is, yes, ongoing scriptures too. It's not just a, a closed book Bible, but it is an open canon where those who hold the keys of the kingdom are opening the, the conduit through which continual revelation can flow. Now, verse 5, And all they who receive the oracles of God, that's us, let them beware how they hold them, lest they are accounted as a light thing, and are brought under condemnation thereby, and stumble and fall, 
When the storms descend and the winds blow and the rains descend and beat upon their house. There's so much in that beautiful verse. We saw at the end, the, the winds blowing, storms descending. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And what's this rock? Upon this rock, I will build my church. It's that rock of revelation. It's having someone with priesthood keys. There's the rock of Peter. Receiving the oracles of God. There's the rock of revelation. That's how God builds his church. And upon that rock, no amount of storm and rain, it can beat upon us all at once. We won't fall. Now, that's provided that we receive them in the way that they are given. God's doing his part. The prophets are doing their part. Are we who receive the oracles doing ours? Are we careful how we hold them? That was a phrase used earlier about those in the literary firm that had a stewardship over the, the commandments and revelations of God. Beware how you hold them, they were told. Here it is for us. Beware how you hold them. I always think of my becoming a new father and holding babies. And it was like, the head, the head. It just, you've got to support the neck. And just how scared I was of how I'm, I'm holding these babies. And passing a baby, like when mom would pass the baby on to me, and I was, I was so scared at the beginning. Just, uh, now it, it's easier, okay? I'm still careful how I hold them. There's importance there. But to see President Nelson giving me an oracle every six months in general conference, how do I hold them? Am I supporting the head and the neck? Am I bringing them in to how I live my life? Or, as it said there in verse 5, am I treating them lightly? Remember that was the caution in section 84? The church, yea, the whole church, every one of you is under condemnation because you've treated lightly the Book of Mormon and the former commandments. It's, what are you doing with my oracles? Five years to the day, the voice came from the dust. Now the dust is collecting and you've got to dust it off. You're responsible for it. And like I said then, borrowing from President Packer, that we're more often punished by our sins than for them. So it's not that God is angry and he's going to condemn us uh, because we, we neglected the scriptures. He doesn't have to. I always joke with my, with my students that this is a principle you already believe in. Because whenever you do something wrong that, you, that, was, that had really bad results that you learned from, that's what you always tell your parents. You don't have to add any further condemnation. Believe me, you don't have to ground me. I learned my lesson. The, the mistake itself was, was corrective. I'll never do that again. And it's not because you're telling me not to. I learned. Now, parents, on the other hand, usually say, good, I'm glad you learned, but you're still grounded. At least that's what my parents did. <laughs> okay. Uh, but in this case, when, I, when we talked about that verse in section 84, you're punished by neglecting the Book of Mormon. God doesn't have to get angry on top of it. He doesn't have to ground us in addition. You're just missing out on a, an understanding of Jesus Christ. You're missing out on an infusion of the Spirit that can come as you feast upon the words of Christ. You're missing out on an enlightened mind and an open heart and, and direction in life. You're missing out on so much when you neglect the Scriptures. Well, that idea of being punished by our sins instead of for them, do you notice it there in the middle of five? They are brought under condemnation thereby. He didn't say therefore. It's like, wow, the Lord agrees with President Packer. Go figure. <laughs> or vice versa, President Packer agrees with the Lord. But there it is right there in the, in the way that he said it. If you treat lightly the oracles of God, and here he's speaking to Joseph Smith and the members of the First Presidency, and through them to all of us, as we receive the oracles that the keys of the kingdom have granted us access to, don't, be, don't punish yourself by closing yourself off to them. Don't be condemned by what you're missing. Open yourself to them. Open the oracles. Open the scriptures and feast. For you who have been hanging in there with me through the Doctrine and Covenants, long as these lessons happen to be, I pray that you are blessed thereby and not just therefore. That was always a strong feeling for me for Institute students because they got a million other things they could be doing. And for them to actually come walk all the way across the campus or drive across town and come to Institute, I said, man, I, 
I know you'll be blessed for being here because you're in, a, in a, good, a good place at a good time, the right place at the right time, I would say. And, and I know God honors that and he will bless you for it. But you know what? I've been to a lot of meetings that I left thinking, well, I didn't get anything out of it, but I know God will bless me for going. And I refused as a teacher. I told my students this. I refused to, to let myself off easy by just trusting, well, even if my lesson stinks, I know God's going to bless them for coming. And to me, it was like, no, I need to teach in such a way that you will be blessed by being here. To the point that at the end of class, you can even say to Heavenly Father, you know what? You don't even have to bless me for being here at all. I got enough blessing as it was. The last hour we spent was life-changing or soul-expanding. And, and I'm grateful. I was blessed by the experience and not just for it. That's real gospel learning. That's real scripture study. And, and I pray that God can bless us thereby. Just as I fear that, that we are condemning ourselves thereby when we don't do it that way. So beware how you hold it. Watch the neck. <laughs> or in this case, turn the page. Open the book. Feast upon the words of Christ. Now, verse 6, again, verily I say unto thy brethren, Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams, their sins are forgiven them also. Oh, Sidney, oh, Frederick, you're in good company. Uh, a fellow sinner, <laughs> but someone who also knows how to repent and someone who knows how to receive forgiveness. You're forgiven too. And they are accounted as equal with thee in holding the keys of this last kingdom. Now, that's new doctrine. It's not just, well, here's Joseph, and then he's got some counselors, some little assistants to help him out. It's like, no, they're on the same level as Joseph Smith. Wow. So this is, this is Joseph and, and Sidney and, William, and uh, Frederick. This is Moses and Aaron and her up on the mountaintop. Now, this still doesn't mean that Aaron and her can hold their hands independent of Moses. They're still there to, to lift the hands that hang down, right? They're still there to sustain him. The, the verse, the, the counsel in section 81 still applies. Yes, be faithful in counsel. Give them your best possible advice. But stand in your office, the office to which I've appointed you. You're not, you're not the president of the church. You are a counselor in the first presidency. But this is an important detail. You are accounted as equal as far as holding the keys of the kingdom are concerned. So if President Nelson cannot function because of age, I never see that happening, by the way. I mean, he's, he is the fourth Nephite. He feels, it seems like he'll live forever. But if you think about prior presidencies, for example, when President Benson, when, as I was a youth, near the end of his life, wasn't able to attend general conference, there was no loss of priesthood authority. There was no absence of the keys of the kingdom because President Hinckley and President Monson, his counselors, were there. And they are equal in authority as far as holding the keys of this last kingdom are concerned. Where a counselor is, by divine investiture of authority, the, the president is. Now verse 7, as also through your administration, the keys of the school of the prophets, which I have commanded to be organized. So now we're starting to expand the responsibilities. What... It's almost like the, the, I was, we always used to talk about the janitor's keys. They, they had keys to everything. So they had this massive key ring with like, I don't know, an infinite number of keys. So what goes into these keys of the kingdom? Well, part of it, verse 7, is the keys of the school of the prophets. We saw that at the end of section 88. So first presidency, bear the burden along with Joseph as far as that's concerned. Verse 8, what's that for? That thereby they may be perfected in their ministry for the salvation of Zion and of the nations of Israel and of the Gentiles, as many as will believe. You see the circles expanding? Oh yeah, we got the people in Zion, the members of the church. Oh, we need all Israel. Oh, we need all the Gentiles. Yeah, I guess this is the, the kingdom of God on the earth. And all of the earth needs to have access to those blessings. Yeah, that's a, that's a big responsibility on the first presidency. They're not just responsible for 17 million members. They're responsible for coming on 8 billion people on the planet. Verse 9, that through your administration, they may receive the word, and through their administration, the word may go forth. 
unto the ends of the earth, unto the Gentiles first, and then, behold, and lo, they shall turn unto the Jews. So Jews first and then Gentiles, now Gentiles first and then Jews. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. When, when it, it, these concentric circles too, not just in terms of audience, but in terms of who is being sent out to minister. Let's start with the prophet and his counselors. That's the first presidency. You need to administer to the next circle, which in a, in a short time period, just two more years, will be a, another presiding quorum, namely the quorum of the Twelve Apostles. From them, you then send it out to the next circle. Uh, elders and high priests and missionaries and all, all the way down to deacons and members, male, female, everyone sent out to administer the word. And so it goes. In verse 10, Then cometh the day when the arm of the Lord shall be revealed in power, in convincing the nations, the heathen nations, the house of Joseph, of the gospel of their salvation. See, it's almost like the Lord is, is using as many different groups as possible to, to make sure everyone understands just how extensive the gospel is supposed to go. I mean, he could have ended it before with, hey, it's Jews and Gentiles, because that covers everybody. Technically, if you're a non-Jew, then you're a Gentile. But just in case you were wondering, oh yeah, even the heathen nations. I mean, in Hebrew, the word that is translated as Gentiles literally means the nations. So oh, yeah, those heathen nations, yeah, for them. Oh, the house of Joseph. Now, oh, now we're back to Israel. Uh, but the house of Joseph specifically, as they would take it, it's like, oh, there's Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim, that, that's the northern kingdom. There's the lost tribes. Manasseh, there's... Lehi and his family coming to the new world. There's the Lamanites. It, this really is meant for all people. And so we need members of the church everywhere to be missionaries. Well, how are they going to know what to do? Well, back up a, a circle. The Quorum of the Twelve, which is responsible to get the word everywhere, will make sure that they're prepared and, and are able to do so. Well, how's the, first, the Quorum of the Twelve going to do it? Well, come into one more circle. And it's the First Presidency. At the end of the day, the buck stops there. And under the direction of those who hold the keys of the kingdom, with the president of the church at the top, his counselors right there equal in holding those keys of authority with him, that's how the water comes to the end of every row. It's described in verse 11, For it shall come to pass in that day, the last days, our days, that every man shall hear the fullness of the gospel in his own tongue in his own language, through those who are ordained unto this power by the administration of the Comforter shed forth unto them for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Beautiful missionary verse there, especially for anyone who's called to a foreign-speaking mission. Ah, oh, wouldn't it just be easier to have the whole world learn English? Well, we're even working on that too. But what we're really after is there's something about your own language, your own tongue, so much of the way we view our world is how we name things, and there's nuance to language. It's one of the beautiful things about learning another language. It's like, oh, that tells me something about, about something I've always you know, known about, but my language doesn't describe it in that way. And I love the little wrinkle that you've added there. To help people in their native tongue, the language they dream in, the language they understand reality through, there's something power. I, I, to me, it was totally worth learning Spanish just for that. So that they, so that nothing was lost in translation for them. Here's the Book of Mormon in your language. God speaks, God, I, I testify God is fluent in Spanish and in any other language under the sun. God communicates to you in your own language because he wants you to understand. Now, in fact, I would even say he goes above and beyond your language to the ultimate internal language, which is the language of the Spirit. It has to be done in power. It has to be done by the administration of the Comforter. I mean, if we're trying to reveal Jesus, and I love the way verse 11 ends, it's for the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not just I'm here to give you a Book of Mormon. It's I'm here to present you with a book that will introduce you to Jesus Christ. I'm not just here to invite you to be baptized into my church. I want you to come into the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, because you will see him here. You'll come to know him here. You'll become a saint through his power and in his name. No wonder I have to preach by the Comforter. And you want to talk about someone's own tongue and own language. 
Oh, there's the tuning fork. There's the light of Christ that resonates with truth because that's how we are wired as children of God. That's the ultimate language to learn as a missionary. Now verse 12, Verily I say unto you, I give unto you a commandment that you continue in the ministry and presidency. I mean, we kept seeing the word administration in 7 and in 9. And so there is a lot of administering to do when you're presiding over things. You can't possibly do it all yourself. So you have to administer and, and extend those responsibilities, delegate so that other people are involved. But just because you are administering doesn't mean you stop ministering yourself. I, I mean, I think of President Monson, who was always ministering. I mean, he was called to be bishop at, what, 23? And in a manner of speaking, he was never released. Yes, he was president of the church, but in some ways he was just bishop to everybody. And who can I bless and, and help? And boots on the ground in an old folks' home or, or a hospital, wherever it might be. Continue in the ministry, even as you continue in the presidency. Yeah, do both. Presiding gives you a perspective from above. Uh, administering does that. But ministering gives you the perspective from below. Those boots on the ground. Now, verse 13, when you have finished the translation of the prophets, you shall from thenceforth preside over the affairs of the church and the school. So you still got responsibility there too, Joseph. And your counselors can help. Sidney Rigdon was the one who helped the most uh, as a scribe with the JST. But you got to finish that. Finish your translation of the prophets. Specifically, that would be the Old Testament. So keep working on that. When you're done, you're still not done with your, call, your larger calling. Preside over the church and over the school, school of the prophets. So that, again, we can get the water to the end of the row. Then 14, from time to time, as shall be manifested by the Comforter, receive revelations to unfold the mysteries of the kingdom. And we talk about an important part of the first presidency's role. Those revelations come from time to time. It's still line upon line, precept upon precept. It'll come from the Comforter. But who better to unfold mysteries than people who are sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators? The first presidency have a unique responsibility to make sure that that continues to take place. And I am grateful for the gifts of, of truth and wisdom that in our day, President Nelson and President Oaks and President Irene have given us to unfold mysteries. In verse 15, just in case your whole calling was for all of those spiritual mysteries, well, you still need to set in order the churches and study and learn and become acquainted with all good books and with languages, tongues, and people. I, I can just feel First Presidency members getting shorter and shorter by the verse as the weight of this mantle settles on their shoulders. And it's like, wait, seriously? It's not enough to receive revelation and get ready to, to teach it in general conference? I'm supposed to set in order the churches? Mm-hmm. I remember section 85, that phrase was used there too. And who's the one that's going to do it if Bishop Partridge can't? Well, one mighty and strong, who we came to understand as Jesus Christ, the true capital O, one, no one mightier, no one stronger. Well, for you members of the First Presidency to set in order the churches, you have to become more like Christ. You have to become mighty and strong in your own sphere. And how to do that? Well, part of it is studying and learning and not just spiritual education. That was verse 78 of section 88. What about 79? Oh, yeah. All the secular education, I'm responsible for all that too. Yep, there's your course catalog, remember? Why? So that you can magnify your calling, so you can fulfill your mission. Well, nobody's got a higher mission than the first presidency. And so learn, study and learn. Become acquainted with all good books. President Hinckley was so good at that. When Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of, of England, came to speak at BYU, President Hinckley was her host. And I remember hearing that in their conversation before her, her address, she just came away saying, I can't believe how, how well versed your president is with British literature. Well, I'm sure that started early as a young missionary went to England and, and fell in love with, with the land of so much literature. And, and President Hinckley knew British lit as if he majored in it, okay? And, and that impressed Margaret Thatcher. There, there's something about being able to, I mean, we learned back just a couple of verses ago, you got to learn to speak other people's languages. 
Well, that can be literal. It can also be literary. It can also be professional as well as personal. It's like, can you, can you understand people that you're trying to lift and lead? Maybe there's no better example than President Nelson himself, when as a young regional representative, and he is at a meeting and President Kimball says, quit praying, basically he says, quit praying to open China because it's not China's fault that we're not there, it's ours. We don't have enough people that can speak Chinese. We, we, are, we are not prepared on our end. We need more people who can speak Mandarin. And a young Dr. Nelson comes home and says to his wife, honey, we need to learn Mandarin Chinese. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah, why? Because the prophet needs us to, the Lord needs us to. Well, that's one thing to feel that. It's another thing to actually do it. And he did it. Uh, Dr. Nelson later would go to China and train cardiologists there based on the laws of the kingdom of the heart that he learned, right? What we saw last week in section 88. Uh, it's amazing the influence he's been able to have in that part of the world because early on he took seriously a prophet's call to do something like verse 15 suggests, become familiar with languages and tongues and people. They'll need you to do that because they deserve to hear the gospel in its fullness in their tongue, in their language. Verse 16, this shall be your business and mission in all your lives. There's no retirement from this service. Uh, you're only released in death. And what is this business and mission? To preside in council and set in order all the affairs of this church and kingdom. Now talk about a heavy load. Like I said, it, it doesn't end until death. You know, I, 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 again, a 36-year-old Thomas S. Monson called to the Quorum of the Twelve or a president Hinckley called to the first presidency so long, I mean, decades before he ultimately passed away. They're in for the long haul, but they never tire of it, even though what they're being asked to do is so heavy. Preside, there's the, there's the authority, in council. You see, we're, we're again, in church service, in church leadership, we're always per, trying to prove the contraries of hierarchy and democracy how much top down versus how much bottom up. And so to preside, there's the top down, but in council, there's the bottom up. Preside, there's the hierarchy. In council, there's the democracy. That's how they're trying to lead things. And they're setting in order all the affairs of the church, the kingdom. And again, that will take might and strength, one mighty and strong. In this case, three mighty and strong. In 17, be not ashamed Sounds like Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here, neither confounded. That's easier said than done. I mean, I can control on my end. I won't be ashamed. I will stand up for these things. But don't be confounded. Ooh, that's hard because what if somebody else has a better argument than I do? Well, at the end of the day, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. God always has better arguments. I think there's something else there too that's hinted at with the rest of verse 17. But be admonished in all your high-mindedness and pride, for it bringeth a snare upon your souls. I mean, you want to talk about an occupational hazard of leadership. When you preside, it's pride. When you are high, it's becoming high-minded. And we'll learn it clearly in section 121 that it's the nature and disposition of almost all men as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose. And these men, it's not just as they suppose. You don't get, much, you don't get any more authority than this. That they begin to exercise unrighteous dominion? Well, Joseph said it's almost all men. Well, it better not be these men. It better not be those who are called to lead all, which means to be minister to all. Chief among you, let him be servant right? The, the washing of the feet embodied that. And what's Joseph doing in the school of the prophets? Washing feet, lowering himself, doing his very best to avoid pride and high-mindedness. He knows it's a snare upon his soul. And that's why he's trying to avoid that snare at all costs. It's with that in mind that I wonder about the don't be ashamed and don't be confounded. You see, if you're ashamed, then there's this sense of inferiority. But the danger of, no, I will not be confounded. Ooh, will there be a sense of superiority there? I, I can't have anyone cross me or confound me. It's, ooh, find the middle ground there. Get to the Goldilocks zone, you leaders of the church, where you're not, you don't have a sense of inferiority, but neither do you have a sense of superiority. Avoid shame at one extreme. 
but avoid high-mindedness and pride at the other. Verse 18, set in order your houses, keep slothfulness and uncleanness far from you. It's one thing to set in order the church, but to set in order your house? Oh yeah, that's right. I'm still a husband. I'm still a father. It's amazing for me to think on top of everything else you have to worry about, the household of God, you're supposed to set in order your own house too. Uh, there's no guarantee you'll raise perfect children, but to, to make that your goal, to set in order your house, even when there's everybody else's houses that you're worried about as well. No wonder you have to keep slothfulness away, because this is an, a never-ending work. And uncleanness, that's got to be kept even further, because to accomplish this work, you have to have the Spirit of God guiding you. I'm so grateful for all that these incredible members of the First Presidency, then and now, did to try to maintain that level of worthiness. So much of what they do are sacrifices on their part behind closed doors that we'll never see, so that when we do see them, they have power and authority from God. It's an incredible gift. Verse 19, Now verily I say unto you, let there be a place provided, as soon as it is possible, for the family of thy counselor and scribe, even Frederick G. Williams. Now this is where you can see living allowances hinted at. This is not a paid clergy, uh, but this is allowing members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, who not by their own choice were called to this and left everything behind, uh, including their source of income. And so to be able to do all of these things, to set in, in order the church, to preside in council in all your lives, to do all of these things, and still be able to eat, and to put food on your table, then we need to provide for Frederick G. Williams. We'd seen revelations before. Uh, we need to provide for Joseph Smith. We need to provide for Sidney Rigdon. People whose full-time service will be to the church. There's no other way for them to live other than for it to be provided for. So here, don't worry, President Williams, you'll be taken care of. Verse 20, let mine aged servant Joseph Smith Sr. continue with his family upon the place where he now lives. Let it not be sold until the mouth of the Lord shall name. In some ways, there's counsel for Joseph Smith Jr. to set in order his house, to make sure that his extended family is provided for, including his aged father, God's servant, Joseph Smith Sr. Verse 21, let my counselor, even Sidney Rigdon, remain where he now resides until the mouth of the Lord shall name. So he's covering all these bases. Each member of the First Presidency has some responsibility here as, as far as where are you going to live and how are you going to be provided for. Verse 22, let the bishop search diligently to obtain an agent and let him be a man who has got riches in store, a man of God and of strong faith. Interesting combination if you're going to help with the responsibility for all of the temporal affairs of the church. Yes, you have to be a man of God. Yes, you have to have strong faith. There's the spiritual component. But, but to be qualified for this kind of work, oh, to have riches in store so that you have something you can consecrate, that you'll, you are teaching with authenticity, you're, you're leading by example, uh, you have proven yourself not just worthy but competent. That's an amazing combination. Verse 23, that thereby he may be enabled to discharge every debt that the storehouse of the Lord may not be brought into disrepute before the eyes of the people. To me, I found it almost comical, but almost embarrassingly so, that people were, were criticizing the church or trying to bring it into disrepute because the church has laid up in store so much uh, as far as finances are concerned to help pay for everything in cash, that the church is not in debt and will not go into debt. It will make sure that everything is covered in advance. And people are, oh, the LDS church is so wealthy and they're hoarding all this money and why, why aren't they giving to the poor? And it's like, are you serious? Is the United States a better example as far as national debt is concerned? I mean, somebody's going to have to pay the piper eventually. Talk about disrepute. Don't put the church into disrepute because we're not in debt. Now, back in the 1830s, it was... The, the debt that the church is under is going to bring it in disrepute. It, we're not going to be able to be independent above. 
unless we learn how to live these laws of consecration and stewardship and tithing and sacrifice and so on. And so people who are leading those temporal affairs, again, no wonder they need to be men of God, strong faith, and, and have some experience in those areas. Some people draw attention to the fact that many general authorities are, are former businessmen. Well, I think these verses confirm that that's a good idea. But they have learned how to run corporations successfully and are now in a better position to be able to preside over the kingdom of God. I mean, in finances, we talk about one's credit score or your credit rating. And even countries have credit ratings. And if I remember correctly, the United States' credit rating is on the decline because of our debt, because of our inability to keep our own financial house in order. I can't imagine a higher credit rating than for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Number one, because we need no one else's credit. But, as a re but the reason for that is because we have learned from the very beginning to discharge every debt. Be above reproach. Be above any disreputable behavior. Be independent above anything else in this sub-celestial sphere. Verse 24, more incredible counsel to the first presidency, which I'm grateful also applies to us. Search diligently. Pray always. And be believing. And all things shall work together for your good, if ye walk uprightly. And remember the covenant wherewith you have covenanted one with another. That middle phrase actually reminds me of what has long been one of my absolute favorite verses in all of Scripture. Romans 8, 28, Paul says that all things work together for good to them that love God. Well, here, same promise. All things shall work together for your good. That doesn't mean that one individual thing might feel good at the time or seem good in, in, in isolation. But even that dark stroke on the canvas is meant to be a shadow that brings out light from elsewhere in the painting. All things work together. Just let God continue to sew the tapestry. When all is said and done, it will be a masterpiece, I assure you. Just love him and trust him. In this case, it'll all work together for your good if you walk uprightly. If you remember to keep the covenants you've made, there's evidence that you love God. But also that those first three commands, to search and to do it diligently, to pray and to do it always. And my favorite, doesn't, he doesn't just say, and believe. Because that seems to be, well, in this case, yes, I believe. And in that situation, I believe. No, it's just be believing as if that were your default position. He's not saying be gullible, but to be believing, that's to trust in God. That's to exercise ongoing, continuous faith. I may not know. Uh, I may not have evidence until after the trial of my faith, but I do have faith in the meantime. It's, it's how I'm, it's how, what I've become. I can still be believing in general, even in the absence of specific knowledge or maybe even, spe even specific belief in individual things. Uh, I, to me, it, when I see people leaving the church, it's often a matter of, well, I didn't believe that and I didn't believe that. And that's okay. I struggled with, I didn't, I wasn't sure about this. Or I, I, I just, I don't have certainty. There's a doubt there. But what's interesting, what's sad to, to me is when, when the center of gravity shifts. It's like there's this balance. And, and they keep moving enough things over on the unsure side of the ledger that eventually it tips. And, and I, no, I no longer am believing because there's so many issues that I don't believe in. It's where your default position shifts. It's when, when disbelief becomes your attitude, when you are being disbelieving instead of being believing. I remember the, the father of that boy that comes to Jesus, and it comes to the apostles first, they couldn't heal him, and then he comes to Jesus, and, and Jesus asks him if he, if he has faith, if he believes that he can do it even when the apostles failed. And the father's incredible words, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. So I don't, I don't know for sure. I mean, the, the apostles couldn't do it. But I do believe. I, I have unbelief too. Okay, we're all kind of ah, somewhere along that spectrum. But the idea of being believing, that's the Lord I believe. 
That's still my default position. And even in the absence of absolute certainty on these aspects of my testimony, I still have a testimony. I still trust in God. You see, whether in terms of faith or of doubt, there's a difference between what I call the propositional and the attitudinal. A proposition is like, can I check the boxes and all this? Yes, I believe that, believe that, believe that, or nope, I doubt that, doubt that, doubt, doubt that. Whereas attitudinal is what's my default position? What's my attitude towards things that, I, that, I, that can't be proven? Do I generally believe or do I generally doubt? In fact, where do I cast the shadow of doubt? Uh, do I give people the benefit of the doubt? There's all those phrases that we use. And what's interesting here in verse 24 is the Lord doesn't just say, believe. Come on, just sign off on everything. Uh, it's not propositions, it's attitude. Be believing. Be a person of faith. Trust God. He won't lead you astray. The, you see, there's been a concern, and I've, I've, raised, I've brought this up in, in another, other lessons, I believe, but there's a concern uh, in, in church correlation, for example, about the, the lionization of doubt or the glorification of doubt, if you want to call it that, maybe just the normalization of doubt. And there have been books written that say, I know, doubt is awesome, and doubt, and, and I see where people are coming from in terms of trying to accept the fact that there are questions out there. And of course they are. And wherever there is faith, there will, always be, there will always be doubt, because without doubt, there's no place for faith to grow. It's just perfect knowledge, and there's no question mark, so there's no... There's no choice on our part. There's no moral agency. There's no, there's no deciding to be believing. Well, then again, I can also understand where correlation's coming from to say, yeah, but in the scriptures, doubt is never a good thing. In the scriptures, the Lord says, doubt not, but be believing. In the scriptures, the Lord says, doubt not, fear not. In the scriptures, the Lord says, how is it you can doubt? Oh, well, what are we, where do we come down on this? Because I can see where people... It's not saying go ahead and be skeptical. I'm not trying to, re, to encourage doubt in that way. But I'm trying to acknowledge that to some it is given to know and is, to others it is given to believe on their words. I, I'm acknowledging that there are some things we, that we ha, the just shall live by faith. And if we live by faith, then we, we don't yet have a perfect knowledge. So to me, as I've, I've, as I've wrestled with this, I really do think that it, it becomes a semantic issue. And what do you mean by faith? And what do you mean by doubt? Because when the Lord says, doubt not, and all those doubts that are condemned in Scripture, it's the attitude of doubt that he is condemning. Not the presence of uncertainties in your life. Uh, every time it's used in Scripture, it's a verb. Doubt not. It defines the person, not, the, not just the proposition. It's okay to say, yeah, I don't know about that yet. Or I haven't received a testimony of that principle of the gospel. It's help thou mine unbelief. But the fact I want help with it suggests that, Lord, I believe. I don't have an attitude of doubt. You see, it's my attitude that moves the line in one direction or the other. It's, it's like, here's my area of things I don't know for sure. Here's the things I feel like I do know for sure. And then there's this line in the middle that separates the two. And it's my attitude toward that line that defines me. If I have an attitude of faith, if I can be believing, then the line moves in the direction of, oh yeah, I know that God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I know that those question marks will someday become exclamation points. That things in shelf three will move down to shelf two and I'll start learning it and then down to shelf one where I just treasure the truths that God has already taught me. Uh, I mean, to understand the attitude of faith, of being believing, as opposed to its opposite. Not that, oh, I have a doubt there, but rather, I, I'm being doubtful. Because that gobbles up the things that we used to have faith in. That, that clears the shelves. And, and far more, worse than just letting shelf one grow dusty, you're packing up shelf one and sticking it back up on shelf three where things where it's just doubts that will never be resolved and questions that will never be answered. Whatever they already were. And then a completely bare shelf, too, because there's nothing happening as far as Revelation present is concerned. 
I, I mean, I'm drawing on things I've taught repeatedly elsewhere, and I, so I hope this is making sense. But there's something about the, the phrase there in verse 24 of be believing. That's not just a signing off on, okay, fine, I'll just pretend I believe those things. That's not what he's trying to get us to do. But he is trying to help us develop an attitude of faith and trust. And as we do so, then even the propositions will change. Because God will reveal truth and confirm faith. And our faith will continue to inch towards perfect knowledge because underlying it all, the, the engine that drives that movement is the attitude of faith. It's the choice to be believing instead of being doubtful. I, I pray that that makes sense. Now, moving on, verse 25. This is a weird one. Let your families be small. Now, wait, what? I thought Latter-day Saints were famous for having large families. It's like if you get, see a, a minivan or, or something bigger, it's got to be either a Catholic or a Mormon, right? Uh, Catholics because they don't believe in birth control. That's more of the, the avoiding the negative. Or Latter-day Saints, more of an embracing the positive because we have a theology of family. Okay? There's, there's a different reason why Catholics and Latter-day Saints seem to have big families. Uh, and that's not what he's getting at, okay? Uh, Big families, awesome. Okay, 25, let your families be small, especially my age servant, Joseph Smith Sr. Now wait, what? Joseph Smith Sr. is way beyond, he and, and Lucy Mack are way beyond childbearing years, so they can't change the size of their family as it is. Well, not if you're speaking literally. He's not speaking literally. Look at the end of 25. As pertaining to those who do not belong to your families. Wait, what? Let your families be small? Well, yeah, the ones that, aren't actually, that don't actually belong to your families. Could you define family for me <laughs> before I try to make sense of 25? You see, if we're trying to establish Zion, if this is one heart and one mind dwelling together in righteousness with no poor, if we're living consecration, if we're trying to have all things common, ooh, then we're family. We treat one another as brothers and sisters. In fact, well, that's what we call each other in church. So my ward family is filled with brothers and sisters. Well, that's all wonderful unless it gets to a point where I am being sucked dry by all of that family to the point that I have nothing left for my own family. Except maybe we can go capital and lowercase that the, the lowercase family, the, the extended symbolic metaphorical family of faith, you can't have them all move in under the same roof with you. The other, I mean, this is don't run faster than you have strength. This is uh, make sure that you do that which is practicable, and that's all that's required of you. And Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mack Smith, not just parents of the prophet, they really felt in many ways parents of that, that whole first generation of Latter-day Saints, and they were generous to a fault. It was, you are running faster than you have strength. It's, you are being so generous that ultimately they're going to have to be generous with you because you got nothing left. For, you didn't save anything for yourself. So no wonder in verse 20, he had, you know, Joseph Smith Sr. had to be told, no, stay, stay in your home, okay? Uh, and here even pull in the reins the people that you let in under your own roof, the people that you treat as, as close family, that's going to have to be small because it's, otherwise it's not sustainable. Now in 26, he says a bit more of this, that those things that are provided for you to bring to pass my work be not taken from you and given to those that are not worthy. I mean, especially if you're called to leadership, this is a revelation for the First Presidency, after all. But those of you who are in bishoprics or elders quorum presidencies or Relief Society presidencies, those that are in a position of influence and of heavy responsibility, especially you wonderful saints that, the, whose hearts barely even fit in your chest because you care so much about everyone within and even beyond your stewardship, be wise Based on what he says in 26, what did God provide for you 
that was intended to stay with you versus what was provided for you that was intended to be passed along to others. You see, if we're all living consecration and, and swing the pendulum too far, if we're so concerned about the evils and designs of corrupt men that we completely abandon that side and, and, and I don't want to own anything at all, and then, well, who's going to provide for you now? You see, like we said before, and proving contraries and finding Goldilocks zones, rather than correct, we tend to overcorrect. And this is to help people avoid that overcorrection. Only you and the Holy Ghost will be able to clarify this. And this is a tough one. I struggle with that because there are so many demands on my time from wonderful people around the world that just want and need and deserve help. I remember talking to my uncle once and just asking him, this was years ago when I first started teaching, but I felt I was being pulled in so many different directions with like a fireside every week. And I remember asking my uncle, how do you keep up with it? Because I know you're in greater demand than little puny old me. And he just said, well, I let people know the limits of what I can offer. And I never want to say no to someone, but I often have to say not yet. Where it's like, what, what is my carrying capacity, especially based on family needs and circumstances? And how often can I do this? And I can tell people, this is how frequently I'm able to do these kinds of things. And this is how, many, this is how far out I'm already booked. And so it's not a no, I would love to do this. And I'm willing and, and wanting. I just can't do it until such and such a time. And he said it was, I felt uh, justified, but also protected. I felt I, was, I had boundaries to honor, but also I had an open heart. That was a, a lifesaver for me. One that I probably need to remind myself of more frequently of late. To just say, I, I, I'm not saying no, I just have to say not yet. And I, I will and want to help. But for now, God has only provided so much time or so much energy uh, or so much ability to do this. And so my extended family, which I wish I could extend infinitely, will have to be smaller than what they or even I would want. In some ways, it's a matter of asking. I mean, it sounds harsh, but like you said at the end of verse 26, you don't want that taken from you and given to you to someone that is not worthy. Now, I'm not saying I'm passing judgment or this is not a go see your bishop kind of worthiness sort of a thing, but rather who in, at any given moment is most worthy of your time and energy or your attention or your means or whatever it is that you're trying to offer them. And it's not that, okay, this is so tricky. This is the worth of souls is great in the sight of God and everyone is of infinite worth. But to think about your limited abilities or, or resources, and, and where can I do the most good? Who can I help the most right now? Because if we can't figure that out, we're hurting ourselves and we're hurting them. We're, we're hurting both the capital F family and the lowercase f family. It's, it's what Jethro says to Moses. You, you're killing yourself and you're killing them. You can picture Moses like, what are you talking about? I'm helping everybody. It's like, that's the problem. They're becoming increasingly dependent upon you. This is when Jethro is telling Moses, you have to learn to delegate. They have to be captains of tens and fifties and hundreds and let them deal with smaller issues. And if, it, if they can't, then bump it up a notch and keep going until it ultimately you can handle the things that no one else can handle. That's what he gets at in 27. And thereby you be hindered in accomplishing those things which I have commanded you. I mean, section 90 is full of things that God has commanded the first presidency to do. And they are they're huge, weighty responsibilities. Of course, President Monson would have wanted to go and bless every single widow in the entire church. He just can't do that. Because if he did, he would be hindered in accomplishing all the other things he's responsible for. That's the irony. It's establishing boundaries that allows us to accomplish what God has placed within our sphere of responsibility. It's like what he said back in section 64 about forgiveness and, and, and holding to justice when it's required. And, and justice, not because you're not forgiving, justice, not because you're not compassionate, justice because the law of, the Lord of law requires it and you're trying to honor that. 
it's not that you're you're putting up boundaries because you don't want people in your life. It's it's not that you are saying no to people because you're heartless. It's that I can't be hindered in the responsibilities that God has given me. And man, the First Presidency must feel that intensely. I fear that those with the biggest hearts, who often have the biggest responsibilities, have such a hard time saying no to the more pressing but the lesser needs that they don't have time and strength enough to do what well what the lord called the weightier matters and i hope that from the from the opposite side if i'm the one asking for that help from an overworked relief society president or a, an overscheduled bishop that if i get bumped back or if i'm if i'm sent to a lesser leader by way of delegation I hope that we can accept that. I hope that we can do a little more personal growing up in God and not be offended thinking, well, they don't have time for me. Well, am I not worthy of their time or attention? No, oh, that's not what, that's the last thing on their mind. But if we're unwilling to go elsewhere for assistance, if we're unwilling to, to try to take care of ourselves as best we can and then go to lesser leaders and work our way through, I mean, are we ultimately hindering someone, a leader, from doing what only they can for, for a far greater audience than just ourselves? The best talk I've ever read on this came from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, and it is called Wisdom and Order. And that's exactly what the Lord is calling for in these verses. In it, he warns well-meaning leaders that you have to know your limits. You have to be wise and ordered. He, he prioritizes things, delegate. He, he warns about people fatigue, which in our day we often call compassion fatigue. And it's a real thing where it's just, I have nothing left to give. I've been giving my all. And unfortunately, that proved unsustainable. For these members of the First Presidency to do this business and mission in all their lives, they're going to have to pace themselves. They're going to have to run with patience the, the, the race that is set before them. They're going to have to work with wisdom and, and order and not run faster than they have strength. Elder Maxwell admitted that was hard for him to master. And so by way of personal reminder, uh, he kept a quote on his wall in his office from Anne Murrow Lindbergh. Yes, Elder Maxwell was acquainted with all good books too. And this quote, which I absolutely love, said, My life cannot implement in action the demands of all the people to whom my heart responds. Can you see why that would resonate with an Elder Maxwell? Who had such an all-encompassing heart? That's true of members of the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve. It's true of Relief Society Presidencies and Elders Quorum Presidencies and Bishoprics and State Presidencies around the world. It's true of parents. It's especially true of mothers. And to see it's not a lack of on my heart. It's just a limit on my time and my resources, my means, my energy. And so please don't take this as, as me withholding my heart. It's just that the constraints of my life keep me from implementing in action the demands on my heart from all these people that I love. I'll admit, as Elder Maxwell admitted, it's easier said than done. But we have to learn to do it. Again, there's an example of, of two types of people. And at one extreme, it's like, oh, I never have a problem with that. It's like, I know, because you don't give enough of your heart to people. That's the opposite extreme that needs this counsel, where it's like, I have nothing left for myself and, and nothing left to give. Well, yeah, you needed some boundaries. Striking that balance is hard, but essential for those at both extremes. Now, it's in the context of those verses that I love verse 28 because it singles out someone that needed to be remembered. Yes, you need to rein in your heart in a way, you members of the First Presidency. You need to be aware of capital family versus lowercase family and, and who's most worthy of your time and attention. Well, in this case, you can't afford to get this one wrong. Okay, I will specify by name someone that you need to remember. You can't afford to meet the needs of everyone, but this person can't afford to be forgotten. So, verse 28, God mentions someone by name. 
And in fact, it's one of only two names mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants that belong to a sister saint. Emma is mentioned in section 25, that beautiful revelation for her. Well, here in section 90, verse 28, Vienna Jacques. And sadly, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. Uh, is it Jacques? Is, is it French ancestry and French pronunciation? Is it Jake's? Because we've, we've Americanized everything. Sadly, I don't know for sure. But Sister Vienna is how she probably would have been, been known. Sister Vienna is mentioned here in verse 28, and she is such a heroine, such an incredible woman. I mean, specifically here, it simply says in 28, again, verily I say unto you, it is my will that my handmaid Vienna Jakes, or Jacques, I don't know, my handmaid Vienna should receive money to bear her expenses and go up unto the land of Zion. And then 29, and the residue of the money may be consecrated unto me and she be rewarded in mine own due time. We'll see a little bit more about her in, in the next couple of verses. But just in those two, you see, Vienna was, was a nurse in Boston. She'd let, learned the, the gospel of Jesus Christ from missionaries, joined the church, moved to Kirtland, wanted to meet Joseph Smith. And she brought all she had, which was considerable, and gave it all to the Lord. Oh, we're doing consecration? Well, here's $1,400 from this woman. And what's amazing here is she gave it all with no expectation of any of it being returned. I don't know what my stewardship will be, but here's my consecration, Bishop. And I love that the Lord remembers her, calls her by name, refers to her as my handmaid. Isn't that the word that was used about Mary? And make sure that she receives enough money to bear her expenses. She's in Kirtland. She wants to go to Zion. And in the midst of all these people that are jumping the gun and rushing down there uninvited and unprepared, she's one that I'll, I'll give everything to the Lord and wait for further instruction. Well, the instruction comes. She's ready. She's worthy. Let her go. Oh, she can't afford to because she gave everything to the Lord. So give her back how, whatever money she needs to bear her expenses. The residue, verse 29, is what you'll consecrate unto me. In verse 30, verily I say unto you, it is meet in mine eyes that she should go up unto the land of Zion and receive an inheritance from the hand of the bishop. She has proven her Zion person and now is ready for her Zion place. She's evidenced the Zion attitude. Give her that Zion address. 31, that she may settle down in peace inasmuch as she is faithful and not be idle in her days from thenceforth. Well, that wasn't going to be a problem for Vienna. She was faithful her entire life. I think she died in her mid-90s in Salt Lake City. Uh, just lived an incredible life of faithfulness and idleness was never a problem for her. You don't tend to save up $1,400 by being idle uh, and then giving it all to the Lord and receiving back your stewardship and, and just making a difference her entire life. She, no wonder she's mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants. She is a sister saint worth knowing by name. Verse 32 then, Behold, verily I say unto you, back to Joseph, that ye shall write this commandment and say unto your brethren in Zion, in love greeting, that I have called you also to preside over Zion in mine own due time. Therefore, verse 33, let them cease wearying me concerning this matter. Now there's something interesting going on down in Independence, Missouri. Maybe a little too much emphasis on the word independence because they were becoming a little too independent of Joseph and the other members of the First Presidency and leaders of the church back in Ohio. You see, if that's the center place, there was a certain sense of, well, we should have our own authority here. It's like, no, the keys of the kingdom are with Joseph and his counselors. And if they happen to be in Kirtland, then the keys of the kingdom are there. And so th there was a certain sense among, especially the state presidency there in Zion, compared to the, the church leadership in Kirtland, are these two separate kind of independent uh, bodies of leadership. And this verse is what clarifies, no, 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 Joseph has the keys of the kingdom, which includes the whole kingdom including the center place there in Zion. So 32, write it to them. Now don't just pull rank. Don't exercise unrighteous dominion. Send it to them in love greeting. 
and I hope they accept it in that spirit. Uh, it's like the word of wisdom. Don't come in with guns blazing saying it's a commandment and constraint. No, here is a word of wisdom. And here's greeting to you and, and welcome. And I hope you're doing well. Same thing here for the leadership in Zion. Because it has been a, a cause of contention. There's been some friction there. We've seen it repeatedly. With repeated repentance and forgiveness, thankfully. But 33, can you please just get this right? Can, can you understand this and then quit bugging me? Cease wearying me concerning the matter. Because in 34, behold, I say unto you that your brethren in Zion begin to repent. And yes, they had things to repent of. But their repentance is noteworthy. It's praiseworthy. The angels rejoice over them. If the heavens weep over our sin, then no wonder they rejoice over our repentance. Now that doesn't include everybody. We see that in scripture often too. You are clean, but not all. Well, look at verse 35. Nevertheless, I am not well pleased with many things. I am not well pleased with my servant William E. McClellan. Neither with my servant Sidney Gilbert and the bishop also, and others have many things to repent of. Edward Partridge keeps making mistakes. Thankfully, he keeps repenting and stays faithful his entire life. It's, remember, a saint is a sinner who keeps on trying. Uh, Sidney Gilbert was his agent. So those that are responsible for the temporal affairs, they've got some changing, some repenting to do. William McClellan has his own issues. He's come home. Uh, he's ended early several missions that he'd been called on. He's, he's gathering a group to take them down to Zion prematurely, the, the, the address before the attitude. In some ways, William McClellan is the opposite of, of Sister Vienna. He's just not doing it right. And so he needs to repent. Verse 36, But verily I say unto you, that I the Lord will contend with Zion, and plead with her strong ones, and chasten her until she overcomes, and is clean before me. For she shall not be removed out of her place. I the Lord have spoken it. Amen. Interesting ending to this revelation. Yeah, yeah, it's all first presidency. If you're just going to set in order the church, you have that responsibility. And namely, setting in order Zion, yes, you have responsibility for that too. You are called to preside over it. Don't just pull rank and comes in with gun, come in with guns blazing, but reward them or congratulate them, praise them for their repentance, chasten them for those that are continuing in sin. That's what God does. I mean, verse 36 and 37 are fascinating. 37, I, I'm not going to change the location of Zion. When he says that she shall not be removed out of her place, that's not to say that an extermination order cannot come. You may not live, hold on to the address if you haven't held on to the attitude. The place may be, well, the people may be removed for a time, but the place remains. And until a people are prepared to live up and into that place. Then the place may be an un, an uninhabited. The, a polluted land may spew you out of its mouth, like we talked a few revelations ago, borrowing from Deuteronomy. But the place itself, that's still my center spot. That is still the place of the temple, even though there's no temple there yet. That is still the gathering place. That's still the site of the new Jerusalem. And before I bring my new Jerusalem, you better build your new Jerusalem there. It's not going to be removed. But what does that mean then? Since you're not, you don't end up being worthy to stay, it means I've got some work to do. It means I've got some calling to repentance. It means I've got some contending and chastening and pleading with you until you overcome. But that's the beauty of the Lord. He's not giving up on Zion place, but neither is he giving up on Zion people. Even when they're far from becoming Zion people, he'll contend. That word contend, it sounds like contentious, but so does the word strife. And when Mormon says that I, he was afraid that the Lord, that the Spirit would soon cease to strive with his people, to fight him, it's like at some point, one of us needs to put our dukes down. Because if God is contending with Zion, if he's chasing us until we overcome, until we become clean, at some point, one of us is going to withdraw. One of us is going to surrender to the other. And sadly, if we don't surrender to the Lord and offer him our will, if we don't repent of our sins and say, God, you're right, you win, I need to repent. 
thank you for chastening me. In fact, that was Thomas B. Marsh, first president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. After he left the church and then wandered in dry, in dry places, so to speak, uh, eventually he came back to the church and said to the, to the gathered saints, man, if you plan on leaving the church, and if God still loves you, prepare your back for a good whooping. Because he will chasten you back home. He will, he will plead with you until you overcome. He'll contend because you're worth fighting for. That's an interesting one. Again, compared to, to Mormon. The spirit is ceasing to strive with man. God has finally seen you refuse to surrender, which means I have to. You won't let me win. So I guess we both lose. In the meantime, though, the Lord contends with Zion. If you've felt that, if you've felt this wrestle within, it's a good sign. God hasn't given up on you because you haven't given up on him. Even if you have sins to repent of, he's, he's pleading with you to do so. Even if you're fighting him, he's still fighting back because he thinks there's still a chance for surrender. So I'll contend with you, but oh, come on, you can do this. And to contend with someone because you know they're worth fighting for. And God feels that way about Zion. We've got to figure it out sooner or later. Now, with that in mind, jump ahead to section 82. It's just two short verses. It's meant for a member of the First Presidency that was addressed in section 90, namely Frederick G. Williams, who I guess didn't quite understand that coming into the, into the First Presidency, into the Presidency of the High Priesthood, also meant coming into the United Firm, since members of the First Presidency were also part of that United Firm, responsible for mercantile and for literary aspects, the temporal and the spiritual side of, of church leadership. And so it's like, oh, I, that was my responsibility too. It's like when I got called into the bishopric, I'm like, okay, I got all these bishopric meetings I got to go to. And it's like, oh yeah, but you're also in charge of the, of the primary. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Or like, you're also responsible for the ward mission. So meet with the ward mission leaders. Like, oh, okay. And it's like, what, what else did I sign up for? I mean, section 90 is full of so many responsibilities for the first presidency. And Frederick Drew Williams' head is probably spinning. And no wonder it took a separate revelation to go, oh yeah, you're part of the United Firm too. Oh, okay. What does that entail? Well, two simple verses. Verily thus saith the Lord, I give unto the united order, it was then called the united firm, organized, agreeable to the commandment previously given. We've seen several revelations that pointed them in that direction. I'll give them a revelation and commandment concerning my servant, Frederick G. Williams, that ye shall receive him into the order. What I say unto one, I say unto all. See, that's interesting that he starts with the existing members of it, and you have someone new coming in. What's your responsibility? Receive him. I think about that every time uh, new membership records are read into a ward. We had several families read in just yesterday. And as we raised our hands to, to receive them, I always used to joke whenever I would uh, call, uh, read those names in, and I said, those that can join us in extending the hand of fellowship, please show by the uplifted hand. And they do that. And I sometimes point out the fact, we don't call for an, any opposed by the same sign. You don't even have that option. <laughs> you might not sustain a calling. You, you might come to a point sometimes where you might oppose something. But not, you're not given that chance as far as welcoming new people into your ward. Do your very best to make them feel welcome here. And I wish we were better at that. How are we at welcoming new members into the church? How, well, how good are we at, at welcoming new members into the ward? Or new people, new counselors into a presidency, new companions into a district, whatever it might be, I love that he starts with the existing members. In some ways, you have to start this process. Be safe space for people to enter They've got enough on their plate. Their heads are swimming with all the, the newness of things and the weight of responsibility. The least we can offer them is a welcoming hand, a, a receiving along the lines of, of what the teacher said at the School of the Prophets. Oh, my brother, my friend, I've got a determination that's fixed and immovable, unchangeable to, to accept you, to welcome you, to receive you and to make sure you succeed with us. 
we can do better at that. If we did, I don't think we'd have such a problem with retention of new members. It, it's maybe even the word itself sounds too, I don't know, statistical or cold. Forget about retaining new members. What if we just received them, but received them with open arms and, and loving hearts and retention wouldn't be an issue at all. Now, what about Frederick on his side of things? That's the other half of the revelation. Verse 2, again, I say unto you, my servant Frederick G. Williams, you shall be a lively member in this order. And inasmuch as you are faithful in keeping all former commandments, like everything I just gave you in section 90, good luck with that, you shall be blessed forever. Amen. It's so important that it goes both ways. That verse 1, those that are receiving, verse 2, though he that is received, uh, the existing ward, uh, as, and then the new member. It's so interesting to hear people say, I just didn't feel welcome in my ward. And sometimes I'm like, well, did you, did you do anything to be welcomed? And it's like, well, nobody reaches out to me. Okay, that stinks, and I'm sorry. Do you reach out to anybody else? And, and so often there's, there's f failure in verse 1, met by failure in verse 2. And then no wonder there's no connection formed. Uh, I remember when I first moved into our ward and just assuming that we must be the only new ones. I remember somebody pointing out that, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're new in the ward. They were just here. There's a lot of movement in, in our area, part, our part of town. And it was just interesting to realize, oh, there's a ton of new people. Uh, and by next week, I'll probably be one of the older ones. <laughs> And as somebody else new moves in and sees me sitting there and assumes, oh yeah, that guy has probably been here forever. If we're all that way and we're just waiting for someone else to be welcomed, no, we just need to reach out. When I lived in the South, I learned that Protestants do that really, really well. I mean, my state president in Tennessee was that way. He was raised Protestant and he said, I miss that from my old Protestant churches. They were so welcoming to people. Uh, and believe me, I'm grateful for the fullness of the gospel that I've only found here. But socially speaking, we sometimes leave something to be desired. Now, there'd be times in state conference even, he'd say, okay, everybody get up and turn around and I want you to meet at least, I don't know, five new people before you leave the building. And at first it was like, ah, that seems a little too structured, like it's a project. Then it was like, oh, we need a structured project. Now, I'm not doing it on my own. I need to be acted upon because I'm not acting. Well, if we were to act a little bit better in verse 1 and verse 2, I love the adverb, in verse 2, President Williams, don't just be a member of the United Order. Be a lively one. A lively member. Infuse some life into it. Oh, and then they, how can they not receive you if you're a lively member? If we can treat each other in that way, whether you're coming in or someone's coming into your circle, open the circle for them. Okay? And be, if there's liveliness on both sides, all will be well. Now, last revelation to study today, go back a page, and it's section 91. Now, I mentioned this one in our little introduction that most people, I think, skip over section 91 thinking that it's totally irrelevant because it's about the Apocrypha. Now, what on earth is the Apocrypha? It's a bunch of books, depending on how you uh, split them up, they're numbered between 12 or 15 or so. And it's books like the Book of Maccabees which is a Jewish history during the intertestamental period. Inter, between, testamental, testaments, between the Old and New Testament. So you get like Judah Maccabee and, and the wars of the Jews in between the Greek occupation of Israel and the Roman occupation of Israel. Okay, So there's about 450, give or take, years between Malachi and Matthew. And the Maccabees covers that part of that time period. There's a bunch of other books that are part of the Apocrypha as well. The book of Esdras not to be confused with Ezra, or Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, the book of Judith, or Tobit, or Baruch, or the Wisdom of Solomon. There's a lot of books out there. And they're called apocryphal, which means hidden. Uh, and that actually, it's important to understand this. There's a capital A, Apocrypha, that are these specific books that are in some Bibles and not, not in others. There's also an, a lowercase a, apocryphal, which is just an adjective describing like, I don't know if this book is true or not, okay? Uh, and that can be used for all kinds of things. Oh, like this story, is it true or is it just apocryphal? 
Now, the, this revelation, section 91, is about the official, capital A, Apocrypha. You see, there's the Hebrew Bible that contains the, our books of the Old Testament. But then there was a Septuagint, which was the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And it included a bunch of these other books that I'm mentioning. Uh, when Catholics uh, took the Bible, they accepted the whole thing. When Protestants, took, and Eastern Orthodoxy as well, when Protestants took the Bible, they weren't so sure about those, those intertestamental books or those uh, books in the Apocrypha. Yes, they're in the Septuagint. They weren't in the Hebrew original. Uh, and so somebody like Martin Luther that wants to be sola scriptura and Bible alone, well, we're not sure about those ones, and so we're going to leave them off. So that's, where we, that's what the Apocrypha is all about. Okay? Like I said, books of Scripture that are included in Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Bibles, not, included in, not included in Protestant Bibles. Well, what's interesting is when Joseph Smith was working on the Joseph Smith translation, remember we saw back in section 90, it's time to go back and finish your translation of the prophets, that's the Old Testament. His Bible, the one he was using, had the Apocrypha in it. So he, finished, he gets to a point where he's like, okay, I think I'm finished with the prophets, but did I get them all? There's all these other books that uh, mm, my Protestant neighbors don't believe in, but it's in this copy, and I don't know. So am I done with the JST? Now remember, he never felt completely finished with the JST. But as far as at least this run through, what am I supposed to do with these books? Should I translate them also? Is this part of the Word of God as is had in thine own bosom, as he described the Bible back in section 35? Well. Section 91 is meant to answer Joseph's question. Are you supposed to translate the Apocrypha as part of the JST? The short answer is no. You don't have to. And like I said, unless you're a biblical scholar or someone that's just extremely curious and wants to read the Apocrypha, then you probably go, yeah, no wonder we skip over section 91. But I want you to think about the principles that are taught in section 91 and see how they apply across the board to any source of potential truth. Because that's what Joseph was wondering about as far as these books in his Bible were concerned. Are these sources of potential truth? And he had some questions. For us, ask that about any movie you see, about any book that you read, about any play that you go to, about any, any source out there, whatever the material might be, Look at for the principles in section 91, and I think it will open your eyes for just how much good there is outside the covers of the canon, as well as caution you to be aware of, of how to navigate all those possibilities. Verse 1, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you concerning the Apocrypha, capital A. There are many things contained therein that are true, and it is mostly translated correctly. Ooh. Maybe I should read it then. Well, verse 2, there are many things contained therein that are not true, which are interpolations by the hands of men. Interpolations is not a word we use very often anymore. Inter means between, and polare, which is the Latin root of polations, means to, to shine or to, to smooth or to polish, kind of brush it up. And so an interpolation is to kind of insert something in there to kind of shine up the rest of the stuff. It's, it's something that was inserted after the fact that, that wasn't there to begin with. That old Webster's Dictionary defines it as the act of foisting a word or passage into a manuscript or book. A spurious word or passage inserted in the genuine writings of an author. It's like, ooh, well that gives me cause to, for concern. So where am I? Verse 1 or verse 2? Verse 1, hey, there's stuff that's true. Verse 2, there's stuff that isn't. Okay, then what do I do with this book? Verse 3, Verily I say unto you, it is not needful that the Apocrypha should be translated. Okay, so th th that answers my question. I, I don't actually have to spend the same amount of time in, that, in those books of Scripture as I did in the other books of Scripture, because I'm not really sure if those are Scripture or not. Okay, Now keep reading, and you'll see the principle expand. Verse 4, Therefore, whoso readeth it, Notice the Lord is not forbidding anyone from opening those books. But if you read it, please understand. Let him understand. For the Spirit manifesteth truth. So if you're going to read these books, just make sure that you read them with the Spirit as the lens through which you look at them. How else are you going to be able to discern between truth from God and interpolations from men? 
You see in verse 5, whoso is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. But 6, whoso receiveth not by the Spirit cannot be benefited. And therefore, it's not needful that it should be translated. Amen. And there it is. I mean, like I said, very short, brief, to the point revelation of Joseph. No, you don't have to. But what I love about it, again, is not what it says about these books in the Apocrypha. In some ways, take it or leave it. But, but everything else that we seem to be taking all the time, should we be? Well, back in section 90, the First Presidency was told, yeah, be familiar with, with all kinds of books, all good books. We saw that in 88, seek out of the best books, words of wisdom. Seek by a little study and also by faith. There's so much good out there. And honestly, it's like section 49. There are holy men that you know not of. There are, there are writers outside of the Christian canon that have understood truths that we need to, to wrestle with and internalize ourselves. There are works of fiction that are as powerful as just about any parable out there in illustrating principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, just meeting the priest at the beginning of Les Miserables when I read that book in college changed my heart, changed my life. Passages of Shakespeare, portions of, of Swift or of Melville or Emerson or Dickens, it, it's, it's Tolstoy, I mean, you can go on. It's amazing the, the people that have written uh, last week when we talked that poem from Elizabeth Barrett Browning or Emily Dickinson, there is so much light and truth that God has refracted through, through crystals outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There is lowercase scripture that, that's never been canonized as capital S scripture. And I don't just mean literature. I have learned things from, from movies or from plays, I, it just the, the news, an article, a blog post, some of the, the, a comment from, from a member of my family. It's amazing how many sources of light and truth we have as people just hit their tuning forks as often as they can. Well, is it true? There are things that are. Is it false? Well, there are interpolations. I have to be a little bit more discerning in those other areas. Does it resonate with the right frequency? Does it, does it agree with what I already know to be canonized Word of God? Uh, it's not just, I'm going to take it all in hook, line, and sinker. To me, it's fascinating to read a book and see what I agree with and what I don't, including the books of skeptics. Like I said, I read a lot of anti-Mormonism, anti-Christianity, uh, a lot of historical atheism and skepticism, and there are places where I say, ooh, that's actually, you were right on that one. Thank you. Those are words to live by. That one, no, nope, I, I can't agree because you, you disagree with all these other people that I know to be prophets of God. But you understand what I'm trying to say with section 91? We can be in the world and still not of it. We can open our minds and hearts to the incredible things God has has taught children of his throughout the ages and across the world. When all is said and done, are these other things, these song lyrics and movie lines, these uh, classics of literature or the latest Broadway play, are, are they on the same level as scripture? Of course not. Joseph was told, don't, yeah, it's not as worthy of your time as the Old and New Testament are. But whoso readeth, Oh, there is benefit to be gained if you have the Holy Ghost helping you discern. I think what the Lord is encouraging us to do in section 91 is to be open and to be discerning, to be on the lookout for truth and relevance wherever we can find it, but also to be aware of the fact that there is a hierarchy of truth. I am so grateful for the goodness that I find anywhere I look. And I'm grateful that there have been wise men and women throughout history that have, that have resonated with light and truth, the light of Christ that is within all of us and have produced word and spirit and light and truth, even if they haven't known Jesus as clearly as those revealers of scripture have. 
at the same time, I am grateful for the scriptures that we have. I, I testify of the words of wisdom that permeate these passages. It has been a thrill for me to meet so many of you and, and to hear from you how much you were dreading the Doctrine and Covenants before we started and how much you have come to love these words as we have opened them and had the Spirit open the eyes of our understanding. There is truth here. These are not the interpolations of men. And I pray that as we are enlightened by the Spirit, we will gain benefit therefrom, eternal benefit.